Hi everyone, welcome back to Growing Up in Scientology. Today's interview is with Joey Chait. Joey was born into and grew up in Scientology, and he has an amazing story. This video is a long one, and you are absolutely not going to regret watching the entire thing, so I hope you do. By the time Joey was 17, he had already completed an awful lot of Scientology auditor training. And he'd also gotten up to OT3. And then he joined the C organization. He was actually in charge of supervising the public Scientologists who were doing OT1, OT2, and OT3. We go into excruciating detail on how OT3 is audited, what were the normal reactions uh, when public Scientologists read OT3 for the first time. And for those who may not know, OT3 is the part in Scientology is the confidential level in Scientology where you read about Xenu and the body thetans and um, the thing that I, I think most people most popularly ridicule Scientologists for believing. Um, only a small percentage of Scientologists ever actually get to OT3 and learn about Xenu and learn about the body thetans. Uh, but Joey was one of them. And he was also responsible for being the steward of all of the others who were doing the same. You guys are going to love this. Now that Joey's out of Scientology, he's living his life as an openly gay male. And he shares with us what it was like for him growing up in Scientology and then later being in the Sea Org. Struggling with this fact of knowing and feeling that he was gay, but being a part of this organization that was extremely anti-gay and the effect that that had on him. I didn't want to give this away in the beginning, but I don't think there's any way around it. Joey's family has owned an auction house in Beverly Hills for a long time. Due to various things that happened, the auction house found itself on the wrong side of the law, and Joey goes into some details about this in the video, so I won't try to rehash it right here. But Joey wound up spending time in a federal prison. So Joey compares and contrasts for us what it was like spending time in a federal prison compared to being in the Sea Org and how much better it was being in prison than being in the Sea Org. And you have got to hear this. Okay, that's all I'll say about the interview itself. As usual, I have two plugs for you. If you have not already joined the supporters of Leah Remini Facebook group, please do. Uh, the contributors of Scientology and the Aftermath answer your questions about the show and about Scientology and about what happens after you leave Scientology. Um, and the second plug is, please don't forget, March 10th, we're having a giant um, Scientology in the Aftermath meetup in downtown Clearwater. March 10th, 5 p.m. to 10 p.m. I'll include a link to the event page in the description down below. With all that out of the way, here's my talk with Joey. Hi, everyone. We're here talking to Joey Chait. Hi, Joey. Hey, what's up, Aaron? How are you? Good. How are you? Good. Thanks for doing this with me. Of course. Good to see your face, as always. Thank you, thank you. Um, all right, so why don't we just start by telling everybody who you are and, um, well, you're Joey Chait. You grew up in Scientology. Were you actually born into Scientology? Born and, born and raised, born and raised. And how old are you now? I'm 39, about to turn 40 in about two weeks. Holy shit, you're older than me. Big 4 <laughs> Okay, so you're full on born into Scientology. Like when you're a parent. I, I, my, my parents got into it in the early 70s before I was born, and they were heavy into it by the time I was born. So by the time you were born, um, were, were they, would they have already been uh, OT, yeah. done, done any OT levels or anything like that? So my mom, uh, from what she tells me, my mom went clear when she was six or seven months pregnant with me, and then she had to wait until I was born before she started the OT levels because Hubbard has a policy about doing OT levels when you're pregnant. Like, I think it's past... The third month or the fourth month, you can't do your OT levels while you're pregnant with somebody. Really? I did not know that. Yes. Yeah, there's a very they don't, very... Want, they don't want to uh, interfere with the body thing. Right. We not, okay, we'll get into all that. OT so, one, who, who, who gives a shit about it, but OT3 is where they really have a problem with that. Interesting. So how old were you when you joined the Sea Org? I was 17, like ju just about to turn 18 when I joined the Sea Org. So that was like 96, 1996, 1997. Okay. And by the time you joined the Sea Org, you had already done a massive amount of Scientology. I was, 
yeah, as a public, I was very, very highly, highly trained. I was in the middle of OT3, uh, solo auditing on OT3 when I joined the Sea Org. And what auditor training had you done? Up to grad, grad five CS was the, was my last course that I did. Yeah. By the time you were 17. By the time I was 17. Mm -hmm. That is highly unusual. Highly yeah. unusual. It was highly at what, unusual. At what age did you start doing full-time Scientology auditor training? Uh, I think I was 12 or 13 at the time. Um, my parents had convinced me to start my training like at 11 or 12 years old. I did like the basic training stuff like student hat, pro TRs. There was no metering course at the time, but then I did my academy levels when I was like 13, 14, and I, I was on my class four internship auditing public at Celebrity Center when I was 14. That's when I started. That's crazy. That is nuts. It was a little, it was a little nuts. <laughs> so is yeah. auditor training like all you did at that time or were you also in school? I was both. So I would go to, of course, to a Scientology school. I went to Delphi first and then I went to Lewis Carroll Academy. So at that time when I was doing my auditor training and my internship, I was going to Lewis Carroll during the day. And then I would go to Celebrity Center at night and from 7 to 10 p.m. I would do my training. And also on the weekends, I would do all my auditor training and then eventually i stopped school for like a year or two uh so i could do like my internships and stuff like full full time interesting so after all that time mm -hmm. of doing that as a public mm -hmm. how were they able to finally get you to join the C org at 17. they tried for decades um and i think i don't know what did it exactly but somehow like when i was in the middle of ot3 i just got so wrapped up in the in the in the crap of it all and like was so into uh the idea of saving the planet and helping everybody and like everybody needs to go up the bridge and this is why the ot levels are so important and i i totally bought into it and then finally jimmy page who is the uh recruiter at ao la he somehow convinced me to join the sea org and i joined yeah Nice. Yeah. Um, okay. So when you went clear, when you attested to clear, did yeah. they attest you to last life clear or was it this lifetime clear? It was it was last it was last lifetime clear. I as soon as I read Dianetics, like when I first started doing my training, I was like, well, that makes sense to me. I have all these different types of characteristics. I obviously must be clear. And I like the idea of thinking that I was a past life person coming back into the fold and so yeah, so I had I had attested to last life clear, and then I quickly did my solo course and did all the did, did all the o, all the OT levels and started that whole thing. And then in '97, I think it was when I joined the Sea Org. So when you attested to clear, did you have any idea at that time what it was that you said that sort of got you through the gate and allowed them to say yes, you're clear. We're going to attest you to clear. Yeah, I sort of knew what I was doing because when you when you do the CCRD, which is the clear certainty rundown, which is where they verify that you've actually reached the state of clear, um, they ask you all, all kinds of questions to try to get as much information out of you as possible. And then eventually, if you did go clear, um, you'll spit out the clear cognition. And the thing that really piqued their interest when I was getting auditing is they would ask me all these questions and I explained to them sort of the concept of like, well, you know, if I'm driving around in a car and there's, and I can't see out the front windshield, the windshield is really dirty. Um, there's bugs and dirt and kind of shit all over it. So that sort of sounds like the clear cognition, basically, because when you when you go clear, the the realization or the cognition that you have is that you've been creating your own reactive mind the entire time, and you've been mocking it up is how is how they call it. So once I told them about the windshield analogy, they were like, oh, well, tell me, tell me a little bit more about the windshield. Like, what did you mean by that? Like, explain that, explain that a little bit more. And then as soon as we ended that session, the, the very next thing I was like, oh you, oh, you need to go to the examiner. And then the examiner was like, oh, they put the little card out in front of the e-meter. It says the state of clear. And you know that you're attesting to the state of clear. OK, so to your recollection, did you ever have to spit out the words? I just realized I've been creating or mocking up my own reactive mind this whole time and I'm not doing it anymore. Do you ever recall saying those words or yeah. did they just like take your words and get you to say something similar? It was, yeah, I think it was just completely sort of twisted around. I think I, I got close to it and like I talked about the whole windshield thing. I'm like, well, 
since the reactive mind is like, is there in front of me, why don't I just take it and move it out of the way? So for them, I guess it was close enough. Right. But, then, but then 10 or 12 years later, as a lot of Scientologists experienced, everybody that went clear back before like 1999 or 2000, they all had to go back and re and redo their clear stuff again because apparently David Miscavige decided that that wasn't really being clear, you know? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, he actually just, um, that nobody could be a last life clear. Everyone who had attested the last life clear was de-attested. Yeah. yeah, which was really, really weird because I had already finished OT3 and OT4 and then I got to the point where they were like, oh, well, you weren't, aren't really clear, so we're going to go back and do more Dianetics. And I was like, that doesn't make any sense because there's a specific policy that says you're not allowed to do Dianetics on someone who's done OT3. Right, right, right. Is that your computer or the phone that's dinging? Sorry, that's my computer. Yeah, I have to shut off those no those notifications. Oh, yeah, no worries. Um, okay, so did you ever do the course called the CCRD delivery course where they actually, actually learn what the clear cognition is? No, but I souped it. I used to supervise students doing it. Oh, they let you supervise it even though you hadn't done it. When you first read the actual clear cognition, did any part of you go, I never said that, or were you like, oh, I'm good? When I first, because what, um, when you soup those types of courses, like the like the CCRD auditor course, or when you soup any of the OT levels, you have to read all of them, all of the materials, and do all of the drills and stuff like that, so that you know what you're souping. And I remember the first time I read that, I was like, okay, I think I said that, but it was so it was so long ago. I never I I never really equated the two, but I got kind of the sim the similarity of it, I guess. So I was like, okay, I guess it was close enough. Whatever. But but you weren't like immediately saddled with some withhold that you had never achieved that you thought you were fine i thought it was okay i thought it was okay for for whatever it, it was i was like oh yeah well that makes perfect sense yeah i told i totally was mocking it up <laughs> <laughs> did you ever know eric martinez from chicago that sounds really familiar what org was he in? so he was the senior cs chicago okay oh he was a flag for the for the outdoor training program i think i think i remember him yeah. So he told me very specifically that when he did the CCRD delivery course, he was like, I never got that. <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, he's in charge of the CCRD delivery for his entire org. Yeah. And then yeah. later on, he had to like get off the withhold that, that, that he knew he had never gone clear. Yeah. And then he he uh, he sent a telex, because Scientology still uses the telex system. <laughs> it's crazy. Um, <laughs> to his seniors being like, so should I keep delivering the CCRD? I mean, I'm not clear. I never achieved this. Should I stop delivering it? And they were like, you better fucking not stop delivering it. <laughs> no. Anything that, anything that puts money in the pockets, basically. Right. Oh, God. Okay. So when you were a public and you go clear, you do the solo auditor course, you're doing your OT1, 2, and 3. Let's tell everyone, what was OT1? What did you do on OT1? So OT1 is, I like to I, I, I like to call it the bullshit OT level. All you're doing on OT1 is literally making a list of 10 people that don't like you. And any of those 10 people that, that reads on the e-meter, you take that person. So like, let's say you put down Joe. You take Joe and you run him through a battery of problems processes. Like, what have you done to Joe? What have you withheld from Joe? And you sort of go through this whole thing. OT1, the auditing takes like a week or two. And then you basically just do that over and over and over again until you're done. Until, this, uh, until the CS believes that you've had enough practice as a solo auditor and you become comfortable with auditing yourself in session. That's the only purpose for OT1 is practice, essentially. Wow, that's weird because that's what you do in your solo auditor courses. Just practice, practice, practice. Yeah. But on the solo auditor course, that in any actual solo auditing that you do is basically flying roots on yourself. So like, do, do I have an ARC break? Do I have a present time problem? Has a withhold been, you know, so like you do that a couple of times, but apparently they thought that that wasn't enough practice and they wanted people to spend at least, you know, several hours auditing yourself on very basic processes before you get into the heavy stuff, like on OT2 and OT3. From what I, from what I remember, the old OT1 was like, go out and spot, 10 female bodies until you and then go and spot 10 male bodies and then go out and spot 10 like it's basically like giving yourself a locational that's what the old ot1 was and then they were like well fuck that we're just going to make people go and 
audit basic processes so that they get comfortable with themselves in session. Okay, so there isn't some hidden standard where you have to wait for one of those people on that list to originate some communication to you about improving your relationship. It's literally just practice. That's what the EP is. I mean, when, when I was supervising the OT levels, I got to read all of the, the solo CS series, which are very confidential and they don't show them to public. And literally the only reason why new OT1 exists is so that the solo auditor gets enough practice and they feel comfortable with auditing themselves in session. And when the solo CS feels that they've done that and they're perfectly fine with it, then they can go on to the next level. That's it. Got it. Just yeah. for anyone watching, EP means end phenomena, which is the things that are supposed to happen before you're allowed to be finished with an auditing process. Um, okay, so then what's OT2? OT2, then you start to get into kind of the juicier stuff. So OT2 is a series of, huh, and this gets complicated, GPMs. So a GPM stands for goals, problem, mass. That is a term that Hubbard created. Basically, like it's a, it's a fancy way of having a problem. So you have on one side, you have a positive and on the other side, you have a negative. And when they clash together, almost like if you point two um, fire hoses at each other and the water just kind of like bounces off of each other. So apparently like billions and billions and trillions of years ago, every being on this planet was implanted with these G with these GPMs that were meant to screw with your head and make you behave a certain way and all these other really nasty horrible things. So what you do is you go through each of the each of the GPMs one by one and you run them on yourself solo. So the GPMs have like a certain sequence of words that are meant to stimulate stuff in your mind and you read them to yourself over and over and over and over again and get the charge off, get the negative energy off and these lists of these GPMs, they go on for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of pages. So when you do OT2, you run it and run it and run it and run it until like there's basically no more, no, no more charge, no more energy left on them. That can take anywhere between 25 hours of auditing to 150 hours of auditing. And you sit there day after day, day after day, reading these things off of these lists of Hubbard's chicken scratch off of these like confidential things that you take in the room with you and you read them off and you just go through it over and over and over again. Wow. So these GPM plots, mm -hmm. these, um, a list of the items on each side. And let's give some examples of what the items might be. Go, uh, just give a few. I actually have some. Um, they're all over the internet, so they're really easy to... Can you still see me if I pull up a different window? Uh, yeah, I can. I found, I'm pretty sure I can, yeah. Okay. Um, so like on OT2... One of the GPMs, just as an example, is called the Big Being G. The, it's, it's called the Big Being G GPM, and um, it starts out with an explosion, and then it starts out as a huge being in the sky. And then here's the actual words in it: "You must survive. You mustn't survive. You should survive. You shouldn't survive. You can't survive. I'm sorry. You you can survive. You can't survive. He must survive. He mustn't survive. And it just goes on for like." 15 or 20 different things. And then at the end of it, there's an explosion. And then at the end of it, there's a line that says, that's what you get for making this universe, get out. <laughs> so, one at okay. a time, you say these lines one at a time over and over again until the needle on the meter stops doing that. Wonderful. And then supposedly you get off all of the negative energy that's on you. Sounds like money well spent, but... <laughs> 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 okay, so you're not... You're not expected in session to build the GPM plot. Hubbard has already put this together. He's he's already said this is in everyone's deep deep in their reactive minds. Except at this point, it's not your reactive mind because you're supposed to be clear. It's deeply embedded in your case or your whole track or whatever. But on 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 OT two and some of the confidential references, what's what's interesting about OT two is that you run these GPMs the same way that you run the clearing course GPMs which is a whole other subject. So you learn about what's on the what, what's on the clearing course and how to run it, but you don't run the clearing course because you're already clear. Hubbard touches on the fact that, that we are all composite beings and that there's different things like entities and like, so you're not really running your case, you're running kind of like the case around your area. And a lot of people, when I used to supervise them, they had questions about that. I'm like, well, just do the thing and you'll find out more as soon as you go up the bridge. 
because he couldn't tell them everything that was on the next level. But he sort of touches on that. So you get the idea that it's not you're running your own case, you're running somebody else's. Right. And I guess there's not any huge risk in someone sort of getting a flavor of that on OT2 because it's not like no. you're just allowed to do OT2 as some standalone action. You do one, two, oh, no. three as a package. Yeah, as soon as, like, the second you finish OT2, it's like you immediately go straight to the next, like, next door to the next course room. Yeah, so. Right. So is it the one GPM that's hundreds of pages long, or are there many, many different GPMs that you're expecting to run out on OT2? There's many different GPMs. Like, there's the electrical GPM, there's the arrow, the double rod, the woman, the laughter, the dance mob GPM, the basic, basic GPM, the one command G GPM, the the body GPM and the lower bet. I mean, there, there's like, I think like 20 or 30 G GPMs total. And each of them, some of them are short. Some of them are one line, but some of them are like hundreds and hundreds of lines long. And so to finish OT2, do you have to totally flatten all of these GPMs or is there some end phenomena that'll get you done with it? There's a, the, it's, it's basically you run it, even if you only get about a third or half of the way, as long as there's no more charge left, like if things stop reading, then you're done, basically. But like if things stop reading on the current GPM, how do you know things aren't going to read on the next one? What happens is, is that if you finish the one GPM and, and, it, and, it, and it just keeps FNing or you, or you keep getting a floating needle on it, which means it's the end of the process, then you go on to the next GPM, it should continue to keep FNing. And then once, once you go to the, like once one FNs, if the very next one continues to be floating in the next session, then that means that you're done. Oh, okay, cool. So as you were going through this, was there, um, okay, well, OT1 is easy because that's just a practice thing. You don't have to convince yourself anything magical has happened. But what about OT2? How, how you know, you're, at this point, you're a very true believer Scientologist. What, what, did OT do, what did OT2 do for you at that time? What did you feel happened? At the time, there wasn't much that happened with me. I mean, I sort of felt like there might have been charge coming off of coming off of my case or coming off of whoever's reactive mind that I was running. Um, I didn't notice huge differences in it, but I, I, it was it, it was more for me. It was like about the excitement of like, oh, this is such a cool adventure, and like these things happened quadrillions and to the to 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 the whatever power years ago, and you know, it's sort of you get caught up in that sort of mindset and it's like okay this is kind of cool and this is interesting and like wow this like this feels really interesting but nothing nothing miraculous ever happened i was more anticipating what was on ot3 so i was like just trying to sort of get through it i guess and get through it as quickly as possible so i could get to the real shit right mm -hmm. so how much of your belief that these incidents were really true or whatever how much of that belief was based on uh, what you felt you were recalling, and how much was just based on trusting the e-meter? It was mostly trust in the e-meter because it's like, well, if it if it's reading on the e-meter, it must be it must be true, of, you know, because the e-meter doesn't it doesn't lie. I think that um, uh, it was it was it was really it was really just kind of like that initial excitement of like this is so cool. I'm on the OT levels and stuff like that. Well, if the meter reads and it must be true, but I think it was all I think it was all complete. And now when I look at it. It was completely power, power suggestion. Completely. Right. Yeah. No. Okay, so then you get on to OT3. What happens? <laughs> okay, so the first thing you do is you listen to Ron's Journal 67, where he talks about that great mysterious thing that happened 75 million years ago. And then the first policy that you read is another, like, chicken, chicken scratch writing that Hubbard wrote. You can barely read his handwriting. And then he explains to you in a nutshell, that 75 million years ago, an evil dude named Xenu gathered up a bunch of people from all these other planets that surrounded our planet, brought them all to Earth, packed them, co compacted them, put them in volcanoes and blew them up. And we all became like these little compacted composite beings to solve an overpopulation problem. And uh, now we're walking around with hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dead Thetans or dead spirits that are stuck to all of us, attached to our bodies, attached to our Thetans, attached in basically to you, and that's the thing that is keeping you down. Right. So this is the big giant secret yeah. that all Scientologists have been told is 
the single key to the future of mm -hmm. all of our, I don't know. It's going to solve, it's, th this solves everything. If you handle them, if you handle all of these beings that are stuck to you, it's supposed to clear the, clear the planet, as they say. So, right. Yeah, so based on your understanding of that story, mm -hmm. are these body thetans stuck just to our bodies or are they stuck to us as a being, stuck to us Both. as thetans? Both. To read that reference, the first thing you need to do is a, is a, is a clay demo where you take, you know, you take the clay and like you make like a little model of it so that you can represent it in the physical universe is what Hubbard always wanted to say. You have to demonstrate um, the line. There's a specific line in the first reference that you read and Hubbard says, one's body is a mass of individual thetans stuck to oneself or to one's body. So you make a, so you make a representation of your body and then you make a, rep a representation of you as a thetan, and then you have to make a little thing of all these other thetans that are attached to both of them. So even when you, so even when you die, and you supposedly leave your body and go and pick up a different body, you're still carrying all of these body thetans with you. The same. So if you were to die today and pick up another body tomorrow, uh, based on this story, the body thetans that you would have in your new body tomorrow would be the same body thetans that you have today. And you probably get some more along the way because birth is a cluster, what Hubbard calls a cluster making incident. So you then get more body thetans and a lot of them get clustered together into little individual groups of clusters that are also stuck to you. Shit, that sucks. Yeah. Uh <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay, so hold on, where do I go from here? Hold on. Um, <laughs> all right, so if... If the line in the reference says our body, your body is a, mm -hmm. a composite or a mass of these beings, mm -hmm. then isn't there a concern that if you get rid of them all, you've gotten rid of your body? I don't think he, I don't think he touched on that. Mind you, I didn't get past OT three or four, so I don't know what's on OT five. And so, I mean, I know now what's on it, but like I never, I never got to like actually study the material myself. So I, I don't think he ever touched on that subject, but. I think, if, I mean, from what I understand, when you do OT7, or was it OT5? I forget, but there's one of the OT levels that's above OT3 where you're supposedly become transparent. Like once you yeah, get you're rid supposed of to attach to like your body's transparent or something. And something. Um, I'm, you know, I'm gonna talk to Mary Kahn soon and I'm gonna ask her about that. Oh, yeah, she would know, she would know for sure. But it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's weird. Cause on OT3, the end phenomenon of OT3 is no more, no more body thetans and no more clusters. And then as soon as you get on OT4, it's like, oh, you have more. Okay. <laughs> it's so right. Weird. So one thing I want to comment on is that um, Scientologists who have not yet done OT3 mm -hmm. have one concept of what clearing the planet is supposed to mean. And even then, I don't know that there's a huge consensus. Yeah. But they think you're literally supposed to sit everybody down in an auditing chair and with new aerodynetics, audit at least half you know, at least 51% of the planet to the state of clear. Was that your understanding of what clear the planet meant before the OT levels? That was sort of my idea of what it was, is just to kind of get everybody up to that clear level. But then it's like, oh, actually, we really meant to get them up to OT levels. So explain that. Explain how that means clearing the planet. So apparently, uh, once you do OT3 and you realize that you're not just yourself sitting in that chair, you have lots of other people that you have to now take care of. Um, Apparently, like, whenever you audit a body thetan or whenever you audit a cluster, it leaves your body and it goes off and eventually will probably pick up another body. But Hubbard said in one of the references on OT3 that once the BT leaves your, leaves your body, he's almost like a cleared being. Not, like, clear, clear, but, like, he's in a much better state than most people on Earth. So he's going to go out and he's going to get born into an actual body. And he's going to become eventually, hopefully, become a Scientologist and come back and be like, "Oh, well, this is you know, this is this is interesting." So once you get more beings like that, and the more people you have auditing on these levels, like OT three and OT five and OT seven, eventually you'll have a whole society of people who are at a much higher level than most Homo sapiens, is what Hubbard used to used to call them. And when you do OT three, that's when you understand, like, okay, this is what he really meant by clearing the planet. Right. That's right, because Scientology, or I should say FLAG here in Clearwater, the FLAG yeah. service organization, 
they push this line that we need 10,000 people to have completed OT7 to shift the theta and theta ratio on this planet in the in the in the opposite direction so that the the spiral is no longer dwindling now we're climbing back up out of the mud and that that's what like clearing the planet means but they don't explain it because of course they can't explain it because it's confidential and they've been trying to get ten thousand people on ot7 for 25 fucking years they haven't done it they're not even close to doing it there isn't even i think there's not even like four thousand or five thousand people that have actually finished ot7 and eight it's like they can't it's incredible it's incredible you can't get enough people up the up the level to do any of that stuff. Yeah, I mean, I think OT8, I, and sometimes I get my dates wrong. I think OT8 was released in like 86. 88. So, 88. So, yeah. 90. So, that's 30 years. They've had 30 years. OT8. How long had OT7 been out before OT8 came out? OT7 I don't know. came out in the 70s, in the, in the, in the mid 70s. Mid 70s. So, 40 years the church has not been able to get 10,000 people and they're not even I think they might be halfway there. I think they might have gotten 5,000 people for OT7. Tell me again tell me again how there's 10 million Scientologists in the world and that the thing that boggles my mind is they say we have 10 million members of Scientology throughout the world and I'm like out of those 10 million people you can't get 10,000 people up to the top of the bridge. Right. So what would the math on that be? 0.001% of Scientologists. It's crazy. Uh, and actually be less than that because they've only, if there was, yeah, it, it's like no matter what their messaging is, they look absurd because if they say there's 10 million Scientologists, then they have to acknowledge that only 0.0005% of Scientologists can make it all the way up the bridge. That's crazy. It's, those, the, the, the numbers don't lie. So, yeah. Right. Okay. So then you were in the middle of OT3 when you joined the Sea Org, right? Yes. Okay. How did you react? How did you respond to reading that OT3 info for the first time? I sort I sort of already knew if that if that sort if that sort of makes sense because on OT2 he touches on um, like uh, like demons and like and like composite and he talks about composite beings um and he talks about it a, a little bit in some of the early books in scientology like i think advanced procedures and axioms talks a little bit about beings and like how we're like composites and stuff like that so i was kind of like okay that's that makes sense i mean that sort of makes sense um and then at the same time i almost felt kind of dirty like i wanted to like What's the name of that shampoo that used to get rid of lice? I think it's called like RID or something like that. I just felt like it had all these weird bugs and shit on me. Because <laughs> you, you realize you have like these thousands upon hundreds of thousands of dead souls attached to your body. You kind of feel weird. But then when you finish the theory of OT3, which is a huge theory course, because once you do that, your whole auditing changes. Because you have to audit yourself completely differently how you were used to before. When you actually go in session... And you scan over your body looking for something. And then, like, let's say, like, you're scanning and, like, you pinpoint to your left elbow. And then the meter goes like that. It's like, okay, there must be a BT or cluster there. And so it's like, well, if it, again, if it reads on the meter, well, then it must be true. I was really skeptical to see if it would actually occur. But then I was going through and I was like, okay, I think there's actually stuff here to, to, to run, you know. And then you... <laughs> and then you talk to the body Thetan and then you ask him what's wrong and then you figure out what his what his upset is or what his ARC breaker problem is and then you get him to go away. So it sort of made sense to me at the time. And of course now I realize I was just talking to myself essentially. <laughs> so help me understand, help the listeners understand. You said you said, oh well that makes sense. In what context mm -hmm. does that make sense? There's, there's a couple of ways it sort of makes sense to me. So Hubbard says in one of the um, original references where he like talks about clear and what the definition of clear was, he says a clear is a being who no longer has his own reactive mind. And I remember reading that for the first time. I was like, huh, okay, so who else's reactive mind could I possibly be running? That's when I first sort of got the concept of like, okay, well, maybe the OT level's are running other people's reactive minds. I didn't know he was talking about people in me. I thought he was talking about people in my environment and stuff. And eventually, 
on OT7, you kind of get into that field a little bit from what I understand. So that's when I first started, I was like, okay, that, I guess that kind of makes sense. And that that's a way that he could sell the OT levels, I guess is the right way to, to express that. And then the and then there's a reference, I forget the name of the reference, but he specifically says we are all composite beings. And then he and then he and then uh, he talks about um, I f I'm like completely blanking on the on the like the, like the weird like um, da like the like the energy fields that we have around our bodies and stuff like that and like how they could act as personalities and he talks about the genetic entity in some of his early books and stuff so I kind of knew that there was something or somebody other than my own reactive mind that we were potentially going to be running I didn't Got realize it. that. So that, that, that space operating crazy, but I mean, it was, you know, it, it had, it, it had explained what I was thinking before. Right, 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 right. So when you say that makes sense, you mean based on everything I understand of Scientology up to this point, this is a logical conclusion. This is not a deal breaker. That's what you mean. Yeah, it, yeah, exactly. And then, and then I got caught up in, and then everybody, of course, especially the recruiters at AO were like, oh, Joe, you just read the OT3 materials. How do you feel? Fine. It's interesting. I guess they were expecting me to have like some ridiculous, like come to Jesus moment where I was like, fuck, I got to join the CR right now. This is the most important thing on the planet. I have to clear the planet. But I did get caught up on it a little bit. And I was like, this is kind of interesting. And then eventually I would, I, I don't know how this happened, but I ended up being the supervisor in the OT3 theory, in all the all the OT level theories, but I was mainly in the OT3 course room, supervising people. And I saw all kinds of reactions of people. Some people were in disbelief. Some people started crying. Some people were like, I just, I don't understand. And like, they couldn't sleep the, like the next night because they were so freaked out. I never had that reaction, but a lot of people did. <laughs> I have heard of many public uh, who have, they call them a psychotic breaker. They go type three after reading the ot3 stuff and on the one hand i started to wonder if that yeah. was just the terminology they were using for people who refused to audit the material because they were so pissed off or in such disbelief but it, would people would actually have some, like a break the only the only psychotic break that i ever witnessed when i was on staff at ao it never happened to me when i was supervising someone because Ideally, by the time they got up to that point, their case was ready. But there was one girl who um, read the materials online before she even became clear. Like she was doing her grades or something like that. And she couldn't sleep. She started to like have like a little psychotic break or something like that. And the senior CS at the time who was at AO was Griffey Blythe, bless her heart. Um, she went in and she actually audited her and like she showed her the ot3 materials like okay so you have so this is she explained to the person like this is why you're going crazy this is why you're not sleeping let's handle that one person and then let's leave and then let's leave that aside for now we'll get you up the bridge normally the rest of the way and get you up to ot3 as quickly as possible so that we can continue it um which apparently is per is per lrh policy like if someone finds out the materials ahead of time it's okay to, you know, handle that one body thetan that's causing the problem, but then you have to quickly get them up the bridge in, in order to do that. Yeah. Wow, I had not heard of that. That's in so they say you've got one body thetan that's driving yeah. you crazy right now. Or it could have been one cluster, but whatever it was, they went to handle that one thing that was causing them to have the psychotic break because once you find out that you're that you that you've got all these body things attached to your body you can't get that out of your head and for a devout scientologist who's still brainwashed into that thinking that would make anybody go crazy it's like yeah, that's a good point because yeah. that's what i was just going to ask you was how did um being told that on ot3 how did that change your whole concept of you or your life or anything it, it was, it was, it was, it was, it was very strange. It was very strange at first. And then after, God, I think it was like 150 hours of solo auditing that I did on OT3. It was a lot for months. It was a long time that I was auditing and you sort of, I mean, at least for me, I sort of got into this, like this sort of routine of like, okay, well, I guess there's more that I have to handle. Like I'm always finding more. And it's like, and I find, I find for myself and a lot of other Scientologists when 
uh, they audit themselves, or it doesn't matter what kind of auditing that they get, they tend to focus on things that they think are wrong with them. So like one, one person could have seizures and they want to do Scientology auditing to fix their seizures. One person could have back pains and they want to fix their back pains. One person could be gay and not want to be gay anymore. And that's like the thing in, in your head that you want to handle. So one of the big things that I was like, okay, well, I didn't become ungay when I was clear. So maybe OT, maybe maybe there's a body thetan that's gay. Maybe I just have to find that one body thetan, get rid of him, and then and then I won't be and then I won't be gay anymore. So that's sort of what I was always looking for. And I feel like throughout most of my auditing in Scientology, from the very beginning of the bridge up until I left, that was always what I was doing. Is like, well, I have this one problem or I have this one issue that I need to fix. Let me focus my attention on that and see if that fixes the problem. And of course, it never got fixed. And you keep saying, okay. It'll get handled on the next level. It'll get handled on the next level. Never get So is this something that you were saying to yourself or something you were saying to your auditor and or case supervisor? I was saying it mostly to myself because you can't be gay and be Scientology, especially on the OT levels. You can, you can be gay, but you can't do gay things while you're on the OT levels. Like, they're, they're Don't like- Don't be gay, Joey. Don't be gay. <laughs> No, seriously, that's what my auditor and the ethics officer told me. They, they, they were like, well, if you're gay, you're gay, but don't touch any dicks while you're on the OT. <laughs> ah, this is a dick-free zone. <laughs> <laughs> well, so that's actually why I was asking you that question is because, um, well, I was going to ask you, did your auditor or CS know you were gay? I mean, clearly you were not living as an openly gay person. Right. But they so, knew that sort of like, gay tendencies and they knew that it had come up before and i got a lot of sec checking and a lot of uh fprd auditing false purpose rundown which is where you handle the evil your evil purposes because of course being gay is evil um to try to fix that problem and it felt like i fixed it but really i was just kind of like pushing it down in my gut a lot so they knew that that was a problem but it's like as long as i didn't do anything in real life, like as long as I wasn't doing any gay shit on the side, then you were like, you can totally do your OT level. So when you were being recruited for the Sea Org, did they have to check off these, uh, are you sure you're still not gay boxes? Yep. Yeah. So when I first joined the Sea Org, they make you fill out that um, life history, but they want to know every single thing about you. And they give you a meter check. Like they had, I think it was Jimmy Page that actually did it on me. He was like, is there anything else that you haven't done? Like, have you like done any gay stuff? Like, have you practiced homosexuality? Blah, blah, blah. Um, and I was like, no, I, I, and I honestly hadn't. Like I was, I was set on going up the bridge and I wasn't gonna do anything else. I wasn't even gonna think about that. But then of course, as soon as I finished OT3 and then I was in the Sea Org, those feelings started creeping back really, really, really quickly. The one thing that OT3 did do is it completely distracted me from all that other sex stuff. And of course, being in the Sea Org, it's like it's not very sexy, so it's uh, there wasn't much time to think about that. Because I was going to ask you, how did you get allowed onto the OT levels with people knowing you were gay but just weren't being gay, like that kind of weird stuff? How did how did that happen? At that time, I didn't think I was gay anymore. I thought that I'd gotten so much auditing, and that I felt I honestly convinced myself that I had handled that part of my thing because they teach you that being gay is a complete aber aberration. It's, it's not who you're, who you're supposed to be. And they pushed me hard enough and they just completely convinced me that I, that I was a horrible human being and called me all kinds of crazy, disgusting things and told me I was, you know, eat, I mean, anyway. So yeah, so I had basically, I basically convinced myself that I wasn't and I, convince them that I wasn't going to do anything on that either. So did you get to a point like, did you go and get a girlfriend or did you just kind of become like asexual? Asexual, as asexual. I had a girl, sort of a girlfriend when I was, right after I left the Sea Org, just to kind of like prove to, try to prove to myself that I wasn't gay after all the, after all the things that happened, but that didn't work out, obviously. <laughs> but I, yeah, as soon as I finished OT3, like, I got deep shit when I was at Flag too for having a crush on a fellow male Sea Org member and just got busted to, busted to the coals for that one.
Scandalous. Yeah. So then more, more, more sex checking, more FPRD, more, more being told that I was a dirty homosexual and then being booted out and being like, well, you, you know, you can't ever walk into a church of Scientology ever again unless you crawl back in on your hands and knees and beg for, beg for forgiveness and do ethics conditions and more and like hundreds and hundreds of hours of, F, of, of FPRD to try to fix the problem. Wow. So just for the listeners, you, you did define FPRD, but the process is essentially you find anything that you've done wrong, which could be anything gay, and then you have to find earlier similar times you have done that same thing in your past lives over millions and billions of years. And then when you feel like you've gotten the earliest time you've ever done something like that, then you're asked, what is the, uh, uh, give me the exact wording, what is the evil purpose or destructive intention that prompted you to commit that over? And so you have to find out what evil purpose billions of years ago has caused you to do gay stuff because doing gay stuff is a dramatization of evil intentions to destroy. Like, this is for real. And then don't forget when you're OT3 or above, once you get all the way back to that past, past, way past life, find the evil purpose. You have to find out whose evil purpose it is because you're a composite being. It doesn't have to be your evil purpose. It could be a, a body thetan's evil purpose or a cluster's evil purpose. And then you, if, if it is somebody else's, you have to find them and then do the OT3 handling to try to get rid of them and get them to leave your body. It's like, it's such a, it's such a messed up thing. And it's super brainwashing. Like it just, it makes, it make it, it, it made me, it made me into such a, such a zombie hours and hours and hours of constant inward looking and like searching for all that stuff and making up so many bizarre ridiculous stories of things that i did a hundred million years ago when i was in a robot body or when i was in an alien body i mean it's 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 crazy, it's crazy. did you say about 150 hours of auditing on ot3 you did solo i did solo auditing on about, about 150 hours Right. And that's the other thing I wanted everyone to understand. First of all, how long is a typical OT3 session? It could be like anywhere from like 15, 20 minutes to potentially like an hour, maybe. You basically go in and you like scan over your body to try to find body things and you keep finding them and making them leave. Find, find one, make it leave, find one, make it leave. And there's all sorts of crazy, complicated, different auditing procedures that, that you can do in a body thing to like actually get it to go. There was, um, there was, a, there was a person who had a body thetan who was auditing on OT3 when I was being the supervisor and the body thetan would not leave. He tried every possible thing to make it leave. So you, you know what they did? They sent him to the review auditor. They had somebody else actually go and audit. They audited the, the body thetan on all of their, on all the grades, grade zero through grade four, because the body thetan literally would not leave. So imagine sitting in a session, there's the guy that's sitting there holding the cans the auditor is asking the questions. The guy who's sitting there has to relay the messages between himself and the body thetan and the auditor to run all the grades processes. <laughs> I wish the people who are watching this video who have never been in Scientology could understand how truly fucking hilarious that is. Like, <laughs> uh, okay, a normal public Scientologist getting the grades, this is when he doesn't know he's a composite being or whatever, would spend tens of thousands of dollars and i want to say hundreds but i'd have to sit down and actually figure that out like scores and scores how many hours what 20 hours a grade maybe maybe I don't know. 20 or grade times four an intensive, one or two intensives a grade yeah 20 hours a grade a hundred hours of auditing and a hundred hours of auditing. let's do the fucking math okay maybe thirty thousand dollars and a hundred hours to receive these grades and this guy's delivering the grades to one of his body thetans that's just, yeah. and, and, and what's hilarious, he's the one that's saying the body thetan hasn't left. All he has to do is say, oh, it left. Yeah, I think he's gone. And then the other thing you have to t realize too, Aaron, is that he's OT3. He can't get auditing from a lower org. He has to get audited by a high level auditor. And those are, what are they now? $5,000 in intensive, six or $7,000? Yeah, let's say six. So. Yeah, at least 40. He spent at least 40 Gs just to audit that one body, imaginary body thing. One body thing that's still stuck on his body that he cannot get rid of. It's right. bonkers. <laughs>
<laughs> so on OT3 for a session, is it like one body thetan per session or can a cluster have a billion body thetans in it? It could be multiples. So like, um, <laughs> so like a typical session, like you would, you would go in and fly your, you know, basic auditing rudiments and stuff like that. And then, okay, let's look over my body and let's say you find a, and let's say you find a body thetan or you find a cluster. If you find a cluster, you have to, um, figure out, uh, what area it's like this really weird complicated thing. Like it's, it, it's either the Pacific area or the Atlantic area. Cause those are the two major volcanoes that Xenu blew up. Get so they, the fuck out. I had no idea they were getting this specific. No, no. And then you have to find the exact volcano that they got blown up in. Um, and then you like busting out a map of the actual present time volcano chains. In the OT3 course room, they had a map of all the volcanoes of the world, and Hubbard actually made a list in what? his own hand of all of the and all the volcanoes. You can you can find it online. It's in his fucking handwriting. Right? But then you find so, so so then you find the volcano, and then you run the cluster as a as a as a composite group of however many body things it is through Incident Two. Incident Two is the seventy five million years ago incident where he blew it, he blew everybody up in the volcano implanted everybody and then compacted everybody together. So you run him through that over and over and over and over again until the cluster breaks up into whatever, however many pieces. If it doesn't break up, you take him back earlier to incident one, which happened four, four quadrillion years ago, which is at the beginning of the time track, according to Howard. So, and then you run him through incident one over and over and over and over again until he breaks up. So let's say that he breaks up okay, they, bro they broke up, but then you have to check, are there any body thetans left over from this cluster? If there are, you handle each individual body thetan one at a time, same way. You take the body thetan, find out what area, which, which volcano, and then run him through incident two over and over and over again until he leaves. If he doesn't leave, you go back to incident one, run him, run him, run him through incident one, and then he leaves, and then it's fine. And you do that individually for each one. So now, what's incident one? Incident one happened four quadrillion years ago. It's basically like an implant. And I will read you the exact uh, thing. I have it here. It's the one with the angel and the trumpet and shit? Yes. Okay. Uh, incident one occurs at the start of the time track four quadrillion years ago. And it goes, loud snap, waves of light, chariot comes out, turns right, turns left. Cher uh, cherub comes out. Blows horn, comes close, shattering series of snaps. Cherub fades back and retreats. Blackness dumped on Thetan. How do you run that? The way that I ran, <laughs> the way that I ran it is that you have there's this little book. It's 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 like this confidential book that has all the it has incident one and incident two in it. The whole sequence of it. So let's say you go back to incident one and you open it up and you read each one. And what I did, is, I guess I just kind of imagined what incident one would look like, but I was thinking that it was coming from whatever body thetan or cluster that was in there. And you just sort of go through the steps over and over and over and over again. And you imagine the so you're kind of just you imagine yourself through the steps, thinking that you're the proxy for your body thetan. So you're sort of doing it to yourself, acting out what the body thetan is supposed to be doing. Yep, exactly. And then like sometimes for good measure, I think I would imagine slightly different versions of it, you know, to, to, to try to think and have slightly different experiences. Yeah, to try to convince myself that maybe like each body thing had a slightly different experience with incident one. But yeah, uh, it's, 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 it's kind of, it's kind of fucked up. It incident blows my mind that you do not hear of more people going full on psychotic from auditing themselves for hundreds of hours. Now I know this is just OT3, but OT4, you do this more, but you don't do it to yourself. OT5, you do it more, but you don't do it to yourself. Mm -hmm. And then OT7, you're doing all of it over again for thousands of hours. Oh, I know. It's nuts. It's ab it's absolutely nuts. So yeah, you do it for on OT7. I know people that have been on, on OT7 for 25 years that go in session every single day and do this several times a day. And they manage to act like normal people in real life for the most part. For the most part. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, what, 
Uh, okay, so you mentioned OT3, going in session, scan scan the body, find a body thing, thing cluster. Yeah. How are you supposed to know when the body thing has blown or gone away? When the when the needle floats, when you when you have a floating needle on the e meter, or when you basically when you think it's left, like when you feel some type of a release, like it's what, like like. What if you felt felt like it left, but the needle didn't float? Are you allowed to say that it went away? There has there has to be a floating needle. Has so to just be. like any other Scientology process. Yeah. Correct. There has there, there there has to be a floating needle. If you run into that problem where you feel like it left and there wasn't a floating needle, there's a OT3 correction list where one of the, uh, there's there's a couple of items on there that you can assess and ask like, did the body thing actually leave, but you didn't realize it? Or is the BT no longer there? Is the cluster no, no longer there? And if it reads, then it should float. But right. yeah. So Every as you were going through OT3, and I mean, you did, you finished it, right? Did you ever attest to completing it? Did. So I have heard so many people, even after leaving Scientology, um, even people who've acknowledged that they no longer believe in the state of full OT, or if it exists, Hubbard didn't chart the way, um, mm -hmm. say, I either had a lot of fun, or I really enjoyed, or I experienced a ton of relief on OT3. What are these people talking about, and did you experience anything like that? I didn't really. I mean, it was sort of, I mean, going back to what I was experiencing on, on, on OT2 it was sort of like this fun, almost like this weird, like spiritual adventure that I thought that I was going on. So in that aspect of it, I, I thought I, I thought I had a really good time on it, but like, did I gain anything from it? No, I feel like, I feel like it, I didn't notice it when I was on OT3, but like after I finished OT3 and I was continuing to get more auditing and more like review sessions and repair sessions and sec checking and the more of the FPRD and the false purpose rundown, it was like, I felt like I, I was just, I kept getting worse and worse and worse and worse. So looking back at it now, I didn't really, I, I, I didn't really feel that way, but I feel like people could experience some sort of relief because like if they, again, it's like if you're focusing on one problem that you're trying to fix or you're trying to handle, if that problem went away, or if you all of a sudden did better while you were auditing on OT3, I could totally see how somebody could think that. But that's the case right. with any auditing. I mean, I feel like you could get that if you do objectives or if you do the purification rundown. It's like, oh yeah, I feel better. No shit, you feel better. You sweat in a sauna for four hours a day and you've been running on a treadmill. I'm sure you feel right. way, way physically better, you know? I feel like one of the uh, taglines of Scientology should be, should be, we believe that correlation is causation. <laughs> it's like, no matter what you're doing in Scientology, yeah. you end up being just hyper-focused on anything positive that happens anywhere at all. And that's the evidence that something is working. Oh my God, this positive thing happened while I was getting this grade. <laughs> I'm so glad I did this grade. You're like, okay. Ontology, anything could be like, oh, you got a raise at work or whatever happens. You always, uh, you always attribute it to your Scientology audit. Always doesn't matter what it is. Of right. course, of course, it has to be Scientology. Couldn't be anything else. So when you read the OT three stuff, okay, so you've already said it wasn't that crazy, and I've said this as well. I've said, look, if you already um, buy into the concept of Thetans, and if you're already a seasoned Scientologist who thinks about this world and this universe, uh, the way I say it is a combination of Star Wars and the Matrix, yeah. right? On the one hand, we're living in a fake world. And on the other hand, with like, the, that's the Matrix aspect. And the Star Wars aspect is intelligent life is everywhere. Okay, yeah. so if, and so if you believe that, and if you believe we're spiritual beings, immortal spiritual beings, there's yeah. nothing about the Xenu story that's a deal breaker. Like, it's not, like, there's like, nothing about that story that doesn't fit into the context of Scientology. But, of course, of course. but here's where the problem uh, it, it, it lies for most Scientologists is that their expectations have been built up so high on what this what they're going to learn or accomplish on this level. And that's my question for you. Were you not disappointed? Was I? Um, maybe. Maybe, yeah. I mean... It doesn't sound like you were severely disappointed, though. I wasn't severely disappointed, but I was kind of like, okay, yeah, I guess that kind of makes sense. And it's like, oh, wow, there's, wow. there's a thing behind it. And, like, I was uh, expecting something like this, but 
I was a little bit I was a little bit surprised in like how much went into it, like all the like all the auditing procedures and like the and like the exact precision of like all these different things. And I thought that that I thought that that part was really really cool. I didn't think that um, I didn't think I was blown out of my seat because of it. I didn't I didn't think that you know that this was a life a life changing like holy shit you know, sort of moment. All right, so you weren't having to like swallow your disappointment like Leah described when, when she read this stuff. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah, she said that on her show and she was like, what the fuck is this bullshit? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, was, I, was, I was pleasantly surprised. I wasn't blown away by it, but I was like, okay, this sounds kind of fun. This sounds kind of cool. I'm into it. By the time you actually attest to completing OT3, I guess you're attesting to no more body things or clusters. Yes. Are you relatively happy with the experience? Relatively happy. It's sort of like a lackluster completion of the level because it's like you literally, LRH says in the policies, like you go in session and until you can find no more body things or clusters. So one day I went into session, I was like, nope, can't find any more. And the CS was like, great, you get to go with test. I was like, really? That's it? There wasn't any like, there wasn't any like, bright light shining from the sky or a burning or burning bush in the corner like you, you, the, it, there, there wasn't anything miraculous it was just kind of like okay i guess i'm done i can't i can't find any more and that's and that's the end phenomena that's the ep of ot3 is you can't find any more it's not even having some win or some realization like normal auditing it's just can't find any more can't find any more that's it that's it holy shit that's weird which of course you find out later that there's way more but they're the ones that, like, on, on OT3, you handle the body things that are awake and readily available for you to find. OT4, 5, and 6, and 7 are picking out the ones that are asleep, picking out the ones that are evil, picking out the body things that are suppressive, and handling them in a very advanced, advanced way. Super fucking advanced. Super <laughs> <laughs> Beyond the technical capabilities of the mere wogs on this planet. It better be advanced for the amount of money that you're paying for to get on Doki 7. <laughs> um, okay, so, all right, so you're, how did you get, you joined the Sea Org in the middle of OT3. How do you become the course supervisor of all the advanced courses at the advanced? Uh, I get, I get in, the middle of, in the middle of OT3, I get shipped off to FLAG. Uh, to go do training because they want me to become a class nine auditor. The class nine auditors are the ones that deliver OT four and five to people. I went there, I hated it, and I was like, "Send me, send me back to AO. I want to go back to AOLA." Uh, so they, so they sent me back and like, "Okay, you're going to be a supervisor." So I did my supervisor, my pro, my pro suit course at ASHO, um, and then they made me the solo suit. I was the solo suit for about. I guess like six months or eight months or something like that. And then they were like, okay, you're going to become an advanced course. Student. So they moved me downstairs and uh, that's how I became an, an advanced course. Student. So an advanced course soup supervises the theory levels for R6EW and the clearing course, which is the alternate route that you do to go clear. And then OT one, two, and three, and also the class eight course, which was interesting because they, they, because I, I, I didn't do the alternate route to clear, so I, I never did R sixty W the clearing course. So they had me study all of the materials for that, and I didn't, I never got a chance to listen to all of the class eight lectures, but I listened to some of them. Okay, so as a Sea Org member mm -hmm. who's on a, I'm going to call it a sensitive post because there's only a handful of Sea Org members that are allowed to have anything to do with the OT levels. Yeah. And there's more auditors, there's more class nine auditors than there are advanced core supervisors. I'm, I, I, you know what I mean? Like every one of these orgs is supposed to have 20 class nine auditors who audit the OT levels. This sure as fuck are not 20 advanced yeah. course theory soups. Did you yeah. get any, any special treatment or preferential treatment or rights or privileges or whatever for being one of the few qualified to deliver these confidential levels? No, 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 no. I was treated the exact same way as any other Sierra member. I was treated like a piece of shit, essentially. They didn't, so when the security they, guard is giving you a hard time because you're 10 minutes past bedtime, you're not like, I supervise OT3, bitch. <laughs> you know what? I probably should have. I probably should have done that. I mean, when like, there was some stupid shit. I think there was something that happened, I think, once when I was in the Sea Org there. Um, I got moved to a different birthing 
because I guess they were doing renovations on some of the stuff. And then like one day they moved all my stuff out. They took all my clothes and, and, and belongings and put it in plastic bags and left it out in the hallway. And I went to the, I, I, I went to the guy who's supposed to be in charge of birthing and he was like, oh, we, we don't have a dorm for you. Where the fuck am I supposed to sleep tonight? I don't know, you just have to find a place. I was like, okay. I got my car, went down the street to a hotel and I booked a room for the night. Pack, pack security was not happy with that. They shut off my security card and the security card is the little thing that you swipe to get into the OT course rooms. I can't get in otherwise. Followed one of the other OT soups to get into the room every single morning for the next two or three months until security finally put my card back up. So I kind of like touted it a little bit. I was like, dude, I'm a fucking OT3 suit. You can't not allow me to go into the course room and you can't blame me for staying in a hotel one night because you didn't have a fucking bed for me in main building. What was the uh, rationale for having you do lower ethics conditions for having stayed off base? Because you're not allowed to leave base like without permission. And I technically, I didn't have a liberty. And I was lucky enough at the time, you know, my parents were still supporting me somewhat. So I had a credit card. I got it. So they essentially considered it almost a blow, an un unauthorized departure of the base. In a weird way. And then so like to punish me, they were like, well, we're shutting off your security card because we can't have you doing that again. I'm like, you can keep it off, but... I'm going to my course room to go soup the OT level. So I always got someone else to open the door for me. <laughs> Even some of the students, like, because the students got their own security cards that I was supervising. So I would just stand there at the door and wait for them to open the door for me. So wait, how does them cutting off your ability to access the advanced course rooms have anything to do with preventing you from sleeping off base without permission? It doesn't. It was it was such a it was such a stupid thing. I don't know why. I I, I don't know why PAX Security did that. But there, other than that, I hadn't gotten into into, in, into real trouble yet. <laughs> but you know, at at that time, that was really the only thing. So maybe they were just trying to you know make a make a point or something. I don't know. Security did not like me. Interesting. Okay, so supervising the OT three course room. Yeah. Um, I don't know. What's the craziest reaction? You touched on this earlier, but what's the what's the craziest thing that happened when someone reads those materials? People started crying. Sometimes people were like, "Oh my god, my mind is blown." Um. I had one student actually, I forget her name. She came into the course room and she was like, she was, she was a, she was a bit of a strange character. She was like, she, uh, she dabbled in a bunch of other religions. Um, she was a Muslim at one point. She practiced Judaism. She was a Hare Krishna at one point. And she went, came into the course room and she was like, now I feel like he's, I feel like he's going to tell me about like the, the uh, entities and like my ancestors and stuff like that. And like all these like demons and like things that are said. And I, I was like, well, you're not far off. So she kind of had a pretty good concept of what she was about to read. I don't know if she went online or read like one of the books that has it in it beforehand, but she pretty much guessed it right off of the bat, but it's not like it's some big secret. I told um, my now fiance about the OT3 courses and he was like, this is the basis of Yoruba, which is an African religion. That's one of the oldest religions on the planet. It's been around for 6,000, 7,000 years. They always talk about ancestors, like in your spirits that are always with you and evil spirits that are attached to your body and stuff like that. So, but we all know that Hubbard stole everything that he ever wrote. So it's not, it's not some big secret. Right. Did you as the supervisor ever have to deal with someone's massive disappointment? Nobody was ever massively disappointed. No. Uh, the 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 most common reaction that I got was sort of like, I guess you could call it like a shock and disbelief. Because when you read the first reference, he tells you the whole story. That's it. He doesn't tell you how to fix the problem or tell you what you're going to do. So, at first, when they first read the at first when they read the informational reference, they're kind of like, oh, okay, and they're just kind of like in like a weird daze. And then once they get into the technical aspect, it was like, oh, okay, this is how I handle it. Like, this is what I do now. And it sort of start because it's get it, it. It sort of pulls pulls people back into their Scientology training and their mindset. It's like, okay, there's an auditing process that I can do to fix it. There's a there's drills that I can do to practice and how to do it, just like they've been doing since their solo course. So it kind of snaps them back into like the the mindset of a good little Scientologist. Right. Now, it's funny, like what you're talking about is why Scientologists, and I'm talking about what they really feel, not what they say they feel, mm -hmm. do not consider Scientology to be a belief system in any way, shape or form. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, you can uh, chime in on this, but I, I never felt that Scientology was a belief. It's no. a, 
It's a thing you do. You don't have to believe it. You do it. Now, Scientologists like to say, my faith, they like to beat people over the head and try to make them feel like religious bigots by pretending like Scientology is a faith. Yeah. But people <laughs> in Scientology don't actually believe it's a faith. Um, and I think what you're saying speaks to that, right? Is it wasn't believe this, pray on it. It was just, just do the auditing. Just do the auditing. Just do it. And that's what you have to do when you, especially when you do OT3, most of the students and, and even myself included, you're doing all these drills and you're doing all this practice and theory to prepare you to go in session and audit yourself. And the only thing that you can think about before that is, is this going to actually work? Because you're learning all the theory beforehand. And then once you actually go in session, it's like, I was freaked out that it wasn't going to work. And then, but then you go into your drill mode and all the things that you've been training for, for the past month that you're on the theory course or, lo or longer than that, since you're on the solo course. So it kind of like it's it's it, it you you sort of snap you snap back into your training, and then you do it, and it's like you don't have to believe it or not, just do it, and it's gonna and it's gonna work. So when you were saying earlier, you gave an example of starting an OT three session, scanning your body, and basically locating a body thickener or a cluster. And let's say you think about your elbow, and it reads like, oh, there must be one there. What do you do next? You focus your attention on it, and you kind of narrow it. That's why you do those TRs. Remember TR48Q1? Yep. And then the TR with the ashtray, and you talk to the ashtray, and you go, are you a corner? Are you a corner? Are you a corner? That's the purpose of those drills, is so that you can pinpoint your intention. God, this sounds so fucked up. You pinpoint your, you pinpoint your intention or your thoughts into like a tiny little point. So you narrow your attention span, and you locate it, and then you basically tell it to go back to the beginning of incident two telepathically is how you're, is how you're supposed to do it. Got it. So <laughs> you're basically just running it. You're basically running it. You're running it yourself, but you're telling yourself you're running it. Some you're running someone else's thing. That's it. That's, that's the, that's the gist of it. You can make up all kinds of crazy things like body thetans and clusters can have ARC breaks. They can have problems. They can have upsets. They can have withholds. They can have overts. And you run the body thetan or the cluster the same way you run an ARC break, the same way you run a present time problem. You go, you do the whatever training that you were done to do until you handle that BT's problem or whatever is wrong with them. And then you take it to incident two to get them to go away. Right. I'll tell you one thing that has me a little surprised here is that, um, that you're giving someone something that's mm, to some degree believable or unbelievable. But then you tell them, but there's an auditing process that you can do to fix this. And you just do the auditing process. And at no point are you even being asked to say that this is helping you. And that's what makes this a little different than normal Scientology auditing, as long as I have it right. Yeah. Normal Scientology auditing, you at least have to get to a point where you have to say, this is great. And I just realized this. And like, you have to have it be great in order to finish. Yes. And the most important levels, the OT levels, you don't even have to say this helped you. Yeah. You just have to be like, mm, can't find any more. Done. That's it. That's it. You literally can't find any more. And I think the reason why that they do that is because they know that like it's a total lie. There is more. You just can't see them yet. So when you get onto OT4, you first realize like, oh shit, there's more body things that I have to fix on this thing. But I just didn't see them before because they have, they're have they stimulated by drug incidents, which is what OT4 is. It's just the OT drug rundown. So, and then OT5, there's more. It's like, there's the ones that are asleep. You got to wake them up. There's the evil ones that you got to fix their evilness and then get them to leave. And the psychotic ones and body thetans that are pretending to be body parts, body thetans that are diseases, body thetans that are pain sensations, like that, all, all that stuff you handle on OT5 and seven, essentially. I never got that far, but that's what I hear. Right. Yeah. So how many years did you end up being in the Sea Org? Uh, four, about four, yeah. And then how and why did you leave? Because I, because I had a crush on a male Sea Org member and we never touched each other. We never, I, I, I never touched the dick. So, <laughs> so it was, it was a very emotional relationship and the ethics people got caught wind of it and they put a stop to it. And then they were like, well, you're a fag, so we can't have fags in the Sea Org. So you're, you're basically out of here. I had, I had wanted to leave for a little while. And uh, I told my seniors that, and they were like, okay, well, we'll get you some auditing, we'll get you sec check, 
All the while I was still on post, you know, going through this thing in months and months and months and months. And finally, when they found out about that, that thing, then it just turned into like, you're, 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 you're a disgusting human being and we're kicking you out essentially. And I was gone within like two weeks. After. So the uh, fitness board? Fitness board, sec, sec checking. Uh, and then they were like, that's it. You're out of here. Yeah. What about the other guy? The other guy had, okay, so by the time they found out about us, the other guy had left the Sea Org at, the, at that time. So he was, so he was a public at that time. He was already in, he was already in ethics trouble because he was a flag Sea Org member. He blew, came back to LA and stayed with his mom, who happened to live on L. Ron Hubbard Way right across the street from Asho. So, uh, yeah, so he, 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 of course got busted, but he was already out of the Sea Org. So there wasn't anything else to be done except like, okay, we're pulling you into ethics and giving you some sec checking. Oh, so did you get, you got busted for a thing, this emotional relationship between you and this public guy, or you were being busted for something that happened before when he was in the Sea Org? Both. Cause the emotional relationship started when I was, he was a staff member at flag and I was there for training. We started a little something there and then like I came back to LA and then we sort of like kept in like telephone contact and then he blew and I didn't hear from him for like a month and then he showed up one day and he called me from his mom's house. How did you struggle or how did you deal in the Sea Org with this um, or I guess even before you were in the Sea Org with this idea of you're like I'm gay and knowing that the whole Scientology deal is very anti-gay. I it, it was a it, it was a difficult struggle for me, but I ignored it, and I thought to myself, well, you know, the Sea Org is a greater purpose, so I'm just going to set aside my own feelings and try to focus on the better good, the the the, the greater good. Like after I finished OT three, you, know, you get caught up in like the wind of everything, and I was a Sea Org member, and like everybody was clapping for me, and like you're a wonderful Sea Org member, and. You're going to do so much good for this planet. And then those feeling, and then of course I met this guy at flag and then all those feelings started to come back in. And I was like, Oh shit, it didn't really get handled, but you know, it's okay. I'll handle it. I'll handle on OT four and five. I'll handle on the next o OT level. Right. And, yeah, um, so. Did you know David Tinoco? Yes. Alex yes. Tinoco. Is there, is there, there's there more than one Tinoco? It was, the, the, I think it was David, David Tinoco. He joined the Sierra AO shortly after I left. I think, I think. Okay. Totally gay. Right. Oh my God. I totally, I totally thought that he was gay and I don't know what the hell happened to him. Cause I, I remember when I was getting auditing at AO, he, he, he disappeared and I never saw him after that for years. I, I never saw him, but I, yeah, I, when I was in the Sea Org, which was just after your time. Um, he was a public on the St. Hill special briefing course at Ash show. And then what did, did throw T3 at AOLA. And then when I moved here in Clearwater in 2006, he was living here. Wow. Yeah, I don't know. I have no idea what the heck happened. But so the reason why I asked that is because David's one of these guys where you're like, this dude's totally gay, right? Like, are we all pretending like he's not? That's why I'm asking you, when you saw this guy a flag, were you like, oh, this guy's gay? Like, like how did that happen? How do you roll the dice? I think that, uh, but see, I was in, I was in such a zombie state when I was in the Sea Org, especially, especially when I was a flag. Of course, a little thing clicked in the back of my mind. And I was like, okay, yeah, this dude's probably, probably gay. But like, I was so good at, at ignoring my own feelings in that, in that aspect. And I was so good at setting, setting it aside. Like it didn't, it didn't, it didn't matter. Like it, like, like it really didn't matter. And now like my gaydar is so much better because I'm not suppressing it like I was back in the day. So now I can spot them really easily. Like I should, like, like, like I should be able to. But for you to start flirting with or having some emotional uh, relationship with another male Sea Org member, like one of you has to kind of be the first one to be like, throw out a little gay beam. I'm joking. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. But like, <laughs> you know, but like whoever does that first is taking a huge risk. How did that happen? When I was at, when I was on training at Flag, um, there was another guy who was a Class Five staff member from LA Org who I became really, really, really close friends with. And I guess I didn't realize I was doing it, but I got a, I got a knowledge report writ, written up on me by somebody because I was 2D flowing him, which basically meant I was basically meant I was flirting with him. I'm like, what the fuck are you talking about? I was just having a friendly conversation with them. And I know the Sierra members are not supposed to fraternize with the lower, the lower class five org people. We were like talking out by one of the, one of the student buildings and we were laughing and talking and chatting and stuff like that. I thought I was just being really friendly. 
I probably was totally flirting the shit out of him, but I didn't realize it at the time. And someone totally wrote a KR on me. Fucking Cosmo Sherman. What a dick. Ah! Oh, Cosmo, he's half in the closet himself, that son of a bitch. Absolutely, he absolutely is a queer. I can guarantee. <laughs> absolutely fucking weird. Cosmo is gay. He does a really <laughs> good job acting like he's not. And he became the senior CS at show. Did you know that? I heard. I heard that, too. Mm. Now it's Alan Grout. Now it's Alan Grout. No, I miss uh, Alan. Alan. I, I, I really hope that Alan wakes up one day. He was such a – he was my supervisor when I was doing the briefing course, too, and we got along really well. I think he might be a little gay. I'm not 100% on that, but I picked up on a little something. I don't know. How can you have someone in their 20s being the senior CS of Asho? It's just fucking weird. He, he, was, he, was a TT, he was a TTCer. He was on the tech training corps since he was fucking 10 years old. He grew up in the Sea Org ranch. Like he, he, he was literally raised one thing and one thing only. It's, yeah. it's crazy. It's crazy when he, he still doesn't know how. I'm, I'm sure he's like 20 or almost 30 now, probably. He probably doesn't have a driver's license. He doesn't know how to, how to drive a car. Doesn't have a credit card. Doesn't have a bank account. His his dad is still probably in the Sea Org at AO as one of the Knotts auditors. It's like he's that's 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 his life. His dad is such a good guy. His dad's so nice. He's you know, a, he's super nice. Yeah, yeah. Like, it's so it's so sad. I miss Alan. So, um, <clears throat> all right. So you leave the Sea Org, yes. and then what? What's life like when you? I mean, it's not like it's you're already familiar with living in the real world before you yeah. join the Sea Org. Yeah. But are you treated like a piece of shit for a while? Piece of shit for a long time. But um, my dad, uh, as soon as I left the Sea Org, I mean, I went back home to my dad's house, and he was like. Okay, I'll take you back, but you're gonna come work for me at the family business at the at my parents' gallery, the auction house. You're gonna work. I'm gonna sty I'm, I'm gonna siphon some of your money out and set and set it aside to pay off your free letter of debt, which I think was like thirty five or forty thousand dollars. And you're gonna work your ass off until you pay off your free letter of debt. You're gonna do your lower conditions. You're, you're gonna do your ethics. You're gonna do your ethics conditions until you are back in good standing with the church, and that's exactly what I did. Uh, six months, I think it was. I paid off my freeloader debt. I did my lower conditions. I got back in good standing and I started going on a course. Again, I had a huge ethics program that I had to do. Lots of reading and essays and sec checking and auditing and like all this stuff, which I had to pay for. And then I got back in good standing and I started the briefing course and I kept getting more auditing and tons more auditing because I was trying to continue going up the OT levels. And they wouldn't put, and they wouldn't put me on them. They were like, you, you need to do more auditing. And then years and years and years went by. And then in like 2008 or 2009, I think, is, is, is when I started to wake up a little bit. And I started reading stuff online, which I was really fucking scared to do when I, when I first started with it. I would like start reading an anti-Scientology article and then I would like close the computer and walk. So I was terrified because that's what I was trained to do my entire life. And then eventually after several years, reading stuff and looking at Marty Rathbun's blog and talking to some other close friends of mine that had also left the Sierra who were also feeling kind of dowdy about the whole thing. And then they left me alone for a little while. They, they tried to get me back and then I was like, no, I'm done. I don't want to do any more auditing. I don't want to do any more of this shit. And then they just kind of left me alone. Right. And it became public that I was not at all interested in going back to Scientology. So at the time when you left the Sea Org and let's say you finished your lower conditions and you paid off your free letter debt and they still weren't letting you back on the OT levels, did, did it occur to you at the time that it was because of the gayness? That was, yes. Yeah, that was part of it. And I kept trying to, in the beginning, I kept trying to prove to them like, well, there's nothing wrong with being gay. There's no LRH reference that says that it's this other than what's written in Dianetics. But times have changed since then. And then Hubbard wrote a couple of other policies where he said it doesn't really matter. It's none of the church's business to get involved in the, in the, in the personal sexual lives of the, of the Scientology parishioners. And they kept giving me more references to read and more references to read about how it's wrong. And I was dating people at the time. I had a boyfriend at the time and I was still getting auditing. And they were like, well, you can't do that. You have to break up with your boyfriend and not do any gay shit while you're getting auditing if you want to go up to OT levels. And I said, no, I wasn't going to stop doing whatever my life was doing. 
And then at the end of it, one of the references that my auditor, Diane Christian, showed me, she told me to read the Mission Earth series. Get out of here. Fucking 100% serious. And I said, why do you want me to read the Mission Earth series? It's science fiction. And she says, well, if you read that series, LRH is, to put it mildly, less than, less than, uh, has, has, has a not so positive attitude towards gay people in, in in general. It basically gay bashes the shit out of some of the gay characters that are in the book. All the gay characters are pedophiles and child molesters and human traffickers. Correct. So he said, if you look at it from, that's the way that LRH perceived homosexuals, then maybe that might get you to change your mind and maybe think that, well, maybe there's something wrong with him. That's sort of what, the straw was already broken, but that that just that just destroyed the, that destroyed it for me. I was like, mm-mm. That's so interesting. So you, as someone living in Scientology and being gay, didn't feel that you were fighting a battle with Scientology's writings. You felt that you were fighting a battle with individuals that didn't see them the same way you did. Yeah, specifically with my auditor, Diane Christian, and with Julian Schwartz, the MAA at AO. Famous Julian, famous Julian. Fine. Yeah. But- he, and and he, you know Julian, and you know Julian and someone like Diane, um, they're getting their instructions directly from the RTC reps. Yeah. I mean, well, they're so being it, personally coached on what's going to fly and what's not going to fly as far as letting somebody onto the OT levels. Exactly. And yeah, so they they just they they just put they put me through the ringer through 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 through, through that whole thing. And then finally I was like, you know what, I think, I think, I think I'm done. And then they tried to call me and they're like, oh, well, there's a new breakthrough. Like, you know, you need to get back and do your purif again and you need to do your objectives. I'm like, I'm not going backwards on the bridge. Either you call me to tell me that I'm approved to go to OT5 or I'm not coming back. And then they never they never basically called me again. So Wow, wow. Okay, so what um, you, you mentioned that this whole conversation with Diane sort of pushed it over the edge for you. I, I sort of thought you meant push it over the edge as far as not wanting the auditing anymore. But is that what also pushed you over the edge as far as being willing to read critical stuff online, or was that a different thing? I had, I had at that point, I was already reading critical stuff online. I just didn't tell them about it. I was already like reading Marty Rathbun's blog at the time. I think this was like 2009 or 2010. So I was already like really, really on the on 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 the fence, almost falling over to the other side. But I was still sort of like, okay, well, I have this auditing and it's paid for. I might as well just go in and do it. And then like they were, and then it, and and then I was just like, hmm. I can't, I can't, I can't go back to that garbage. So how's all this affecting your family life during this time? Because your whole family's in Scientology or was? They are. They are still. Well, mo- m- most of them are. <laughs> so how is, um, did did being kicked out of the Sea Org affect your family life? Did yeah. um, the they fact were, that it was over a gay issue affect your family life? They were terribly disappointed in me. And they were like, I can't believe you did this. Like your embarrassment and da, 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 da. But my dad, my dad, bless his heart, he was very, he was very understanding of the whole thing. He was like, you know, you fucked up and I'm pissed off at you, but you're going to fix it and I'm going to help you fix it. And that's how pretty much he's been my entire life. He did. He was always a very domineering father and he sort of took control of everything. And he was up until recently when he had his heart attack a couple of years ago, but, um, but he, 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 he he understood it and then when i find like years later like maybe a decade later i finally came out of the closet to my mother and i came out to the closet to my father and they were like okay it's not what we imagined for you but you know you're going to live your life the way that you're going to live your life and we're very happy for you and we just we just we just want you to be happy were they surprised my mom wasn't terribly surprised my dad was a little surprised well because i've spoken with people who knew who were in the sea org when you were a public or yeah. when this year, when you were in this year and they're like, Joey was fucking gay as shit. I was. And I, I am. That's that. That's who I am. He said he was surprised, which I was like, really? Okay, I guess so. <laughs> but my mom was kind of like, well, I kind of had an idea, you know, but I wasn't 100% sure. But okay, well, thank you so much for telling me. Yeah. When you were at Flag, did you know Sergio Gill? Yes. Did yes. you know this guy is gay as, can, as gay can be? He, yes. I'm mentioning that because that's an example yes. that, you know, I'm asking you this question. How could your dad not know? Yeah. I was on flag for years with Sergio mm-hmm. and partly because of my naivete yeah. and my virginness. Yeah. <laughs> 
it didn't even ever enter my mind that Sergio was gay. In retrospect, you're like, oh yeah, it's obvious. But at the time I was like, he can't be gay because he's clear. He can't right. be gay because he's a Sea Org member. He can't be gay because he's a successful Sea Org member. He's just flamboyant and friendly. He's just, a, he's just a flamboyant Mexican guy. I mean, it's like it's not. Yeah, it's weird, and that's how that's how I saw myself. And if you if you would have asked me at the time, what are you talking about? Of course, I'm not gay. Yeah, I like to tap dance, and I like listening to Madonna, but that doesn't make me gay. But uh, but I was fucking gay. But I couldn't. I couldn't admit it to myself at the time, which is really, which is really unfortunate. I mean, if I could go back, I would do things way differently. But everybody has the process that they have to go through to to come to terms with themselves. So by the time uh, the thing happened at the end of the Sea Org and you got kicked out for that, it seems like there would have been a time when you were still in the Sea Org that you sort of stopped trying to deny yeah. that this was true. And just sort of went with it. Like it didn't. It doesn't even sound like you were terribly embarrassed by being kicked out of the Sea Org for gay issues. You just kind of rolled with it. So, so what changed? At, at what point did something change? I was a little bit embarrassed about it. I mean, I mean, I got in serious ethics trouble for it. They, I got locked in a room on the seventh floor of main building with no windows, and a, and a, and a security guard. Uh, put his bed in front of the door at night when I was sleeping and I was under watch 24 seven so that I couldn't leave in the middle of the night. The only time I was allowed to leave the room was to go across the street to AO to get my auditing. And that I was in that room for about two months total, I think. Yeah, that was, that was, that was not fun. <laughs> um, so it wasn't embarrassing. It was just, it was, it was more of like, um, like a kind of like an, oh shit, I let everybody down. Like I was part of this, I was part of this thing, and I was not, um, and I was not doing my job as a SEER member. I was this. I was that. There were all kinds of weird, weird, weird feelings I was having. Embarrassment, I don't think, was really one of them. It was mostly disappointing to myself. L let me clarify something because I think I might have gotten something wrong. Um, and I'm comparing what happened with you when you left the SEER to what happened with Nora Crest. Uh, actually, she just got married. Nora Ames. Um, when she was. Um, was left the Sea Org, she was kind of going out of her way to try to live a heterosexual lifestyle to sort of keep keep the gayness away. You mentioned that you had gotten a girlfriend at one point. Was that before the Sea Org or was that after this incident of leaving the Sea Org? That was after, that was after the Sea Org. Like that was pretty shortly right after the Sea Org. So when you left the Sea Org, you got a girlfriend before you ever went and got a boyfriend. Yeah, because I was still trying to convince myself that I really that I really wasn't gay and that I had just kind of slipped I kind of slipped a little bit. And that I was going to get back on the straight and narrow and I was going to do my lower conditions that I, I, everything would go back to normal the way it was before I joined the Sea At least that's what Okay, I, I didn't catch that. I didn't catch that. So then at what like, point, after leaving the Sea Org, were you like, eh, fuck this bullshit. I'm just going to live with it. Live with it. Uh, God, I don't even remember. It was a couple of years after I left the Sea Org. I left the Sea Org in 2000 or 2001. And then so like starting in like 2000. Four or 2005, I started experimenting with like the gay part of my myself, and that's when I started going out on dates and like meeting other guys and like actually, like, actually doing gay gay things. So that's when I was starting to explore that side of my my psyche, I guess you could say, and discover what it really was. Yeah, really interesting. And then, so and, and my honor yeah. that I was doing it at the time, but they were like, okay, well, you know. We're going to continue auditing you, but you're not going to get up your OT levels. And I somehow convinced myself that I was going to change their mind, like using some sort of weird logic stuff on them, but that didn't fucking work. Right. So um, considering that all Scientologists are supposed to go up the bridge as fast as possible, you'd think that the people who have the most time and the most money would be the ones getting up to the top of the bridge. And yet John Travolta has never been allowed onto OT7 ever. It's obviously because of his bisexuality. What are your thoughts about it? I'm assuming that that's probably the reason why. And I'm assuming that he has some weird arrangement with his wife, which he should be perfectly allowed to have something like that. It's his marriage. He can do whatever he wants with it. If he's gay, if he's bisexual, whatever position on the, on the sexuality spectrum he is, it shouldn't really matter. But it's like, the and, it, and if he wants to go up the bridge, there shouldn't be any reason why he can't go up. It's just, it's, just, it's just stupid. It's just stupid what that whole thing is. 
but John will never, I don't think he'll ever leave Scientology um, because they have all of his evil gay deeds on record. And I mean, he, he could probably leave quietly if he wanted to and just continue his life the way that he wanted to, but they would hound him because he's high profile. He's got millions and millions of dollars in the bank. It's like they need his they need his donations. See, the thing is, if he left, um, uh, I have been led to believe that between the two of them, Kelly's the true believer, and that yeah, John believes enough. Um, but really, his loyalty is to Kelly and their kids and the family. And he's and Kelly wears the pants. Ke- is- Kelly Kelly's a sweetheart. I I adore Kelly, but yeah, she's hard. She she's hardcore. Do you think she's more hardcore than John? Did you meet John? I only met him once or twice. I didn't spend too much time with him. But Kelly, I spent a lot of time with him. I mean, I I love her dearly, but she's she's deep down the rabbit hole, and I don't know if she's ever going to get out of there. I really I really don't think because she believes everything that they tell her. Right. Oh well, that's the other thing I was I was going to say there is that if John left, it would kind of imply that he and Kelly were breaking up. I mean, because that's the only circumstance under which I could ever see him leaving. And then in which case, all we'd have to do would just be to fucking come out as at least bisexual. And what what could the church do to him? Hollywood is so accepting now, it, it wouldn't really matter for his career necessarily. I feel like if he came out, most, I mean, when I talk to people at, at people who are in the industry, like when I go out to these social networking events or parties and stuff like that, and John Travolta comes up and the fact that he's gay and everybody's like, yeah, we've known that for, you know, tell us something we don't know. So I feel like most of everybody are like, oh, okay, good. He finally said something. He finally said something about right. it. Nobody cares. You know, the studios are pretty hypocritical on this subject, actually. As much as, as welcoming um, of uh, the gay community as Hollywood is in general, it still ruins the careers of leading men. It can't. Like, it, they're, they're, they're hypocritical in that respect. They don't want to hear that this leading male actor is gay. They don't want that. No, it's yeah, it's, it's true. I know. It's not going to get you ostracized from the industry, but you're not going right. to get the same parts. You're not going to get the right parts that you want. Exactly. Right. Um, okay, so you mentioned your family's business, um, this auction gallery. Um, and due to some nefariousness, selling... T-Rex skulls to Nicolas Cage and shit. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, the, the gallery wound up in some trouble. You wound up in some trouble. Um, tell us briefly uh, what ended up happening. So huh, when I was working for the gallery with uh, my parents, briefly in a nutshell, um, I was. we used to sell antiques and we used to sell things that were made out of ivory. Uh and elephants are not endangered, but they're on the on like the on the protected species list. And there were a couple of things that I did wrong um, that got me in a little bit of trouble with the government because the environmental, not the environmental protection, the uh, Department of Fish and Wildlife. I can't go into all the details, but everything is online. You can just Google my name, and like the whole the whole sentencing brief is there if you actually want to read it. But basically, what happened was is that I pled guilty to uh, making a false statement on a customs form and a, and a customs document. And so I had to do a little bit of jail time. So I went to, um, I went to a federal prison, a prison camp. So it's, all, it's like the so-called like club fed thing. Um, when that happened though, um, and you can read this in the sentencing brief, I talked about like the crazy shit that happened to me when I was in Scientology. And I talked about all the gay stuff and I talked about the abuse that I suffered, the mental and the physical, like getting punched and getting slapped when I was in the Sea Org and being, being, being raised in a family with a, with, in the shadow of a domineering father and like all that other stuff. Um, so I went to prison for about eight months. And, but because I talked about Scientology in a negative fashion in open court to the judge, that made me obviously a declared suppressive person now. So now uh, my parents won't talk to me. Uh, I'm, I'm declared, I'm persona non grata in Scientology. I'm evil, I'm shit, I'm terrible. I wanna take down the world. I'm worse than Hitler in their eyes. Um, and yeah, so none of, my fr- n- none of my former Scientology friends will talk to me. My parents completely cut me off. And it's, it's a weird, it's a very weird situation. But yeah, no, I haven't, I haven't talked to my mom, especially in like almost two years now. 
since that since that happened. Wow. So yeah. the church wasn't going to expel you for being accused or convicted of felonies, but saying anything negative about Scientology in court, that crossed the line. That that crossed the line. When I was when I was going through this whole process, Julian was always in communication with my mother. And my mother was telling him everything. And he was like, well, if Joey needs any help, let us know. You know, because he knew that I pled guilty. He knew that I had a sentencing hearing coming up. And he knew that I was going to possibly be sentenced to go to prison if if not get probation. But I, um, but it wasn't really like, oh, my God, Joey, you, you know, pled guilty to a felon. We're going to kick him out of the church. As soon as I said something bad about Scientology in public, that was basically it for them. Like, they were like, nope, he's cut off. Did they even try to put it in writing or they're like, yeah, you know what you did? I know. I mean, I, I mean, if they did, I never, I never saw anything. So has anybody ever told you that they went in and read whatever they put together? They, they talk about all my past, like sexual perversions and stuff, which basically meant like all my gay stuff, you know, like the time that I kissed a guy or like I did something or like I flirted with the Sea Org member, you know, when I was in the Sea Org, which is like, it's not in their eyes. It's a, it's a crime, but not what in the you? world. Though. What do you think about this? Um, do, do you know Shoshone Posner? Sh Shoshone Sky? Sorry, she was married to... Um... Shoshone Sky was married to Judd Posner. Yes, that's right. Okay. So Shoshone mm -hmm. goes on a Sea Org mission to Austin, Texas. Okay. Um, has some sort of emotional relationship or physical, I don't know, with a, a public female Scientologist. Jesus. Um, goes back gets kicked out of the Sea Org or leaves, whatever, moves to Austin, is married to this woman now. They have a child right. and is actively on lines at the Austin Org. How the fuck do you reconcile that with your experience being gay in Scientology? Times have changed in Scientology, so I think now like they kind of have to not make a big fuss about it because because of the way society is with, with gay people in general. Um, she's never gonna get on the OT levels if she's married to, if she's, if she's married to a woman. She can, she can get up to clear, but at that point, I can guarantee that she's not gonna get onto her OT levels. Like there's, there, there's no way they're, they're gonna let that happen. Exactly, and this is how Scientology is gonna get away with acting like they're gay friendly. Yeah, exactly. They're gonna say, come into our orgs, gay people. We're having gay night at the Austin Org. I don't mean to be so, you know, fucking right, about yeah, it. No, no, no. But I mean, they're going to get away with acting very gay friendly. Absolutely. When the truth is, they've always let gay people in. They've yeah. always done that. They yeah. have. And, and even at the Org level, maybe they won't do these weird ethics cycles where they're trying to handle someone in ethics for being gay. Maybe they'll wait for that person to go to the Sea Org Org and do their OT preparations and their OTL. Maybe they'll wait. They, yes. Do you know what I mean? But they're not they'll getting still, on their OT level, just like you said. They'll, they'll still take their money. They'll still take their money. Gay money's by still the, green. By the way, Aaron, um, my battery on my computer is at 1%, and I forgot my stupid charger. So I'm let's so just take a timeout right here, and I'll splice them together. Awesome. Okay, great. We're back, finishing up with Joey. Hey, Joey. Hey, what's up? We're back. You had briefly explained that... Um, you, uh, based on some stuff that happened at the uh, the auction house or the gallery, what do you what do you refer to it as? A gallery or an auction house? The gallery. It's not really a gallery. It's an auction house, but we used to always say the gallery. Okay, that you ended up um, being sentenced to either sentenced or serving eight months at a federal prison. Yep. Was that the sentence, or is that what you served? The sentence was twelve months in one day. So, in the federal system, if you get anything more than a year in prison, you get time off for good behavior. So, the judge gave me that one extra day so that I didn't have to serve the twelve months. I got three. I got three and a half months off, so I didn't have to serve the full year. So, I served a little bit less than a year. Got it. Mm -hmm. Okay. So then you were in the Sierra for about four years. Is that right? Yeah. So how did four years in the Sea Org compare to eight months in federal prison? <laughs> prison was a piece of cake compared to being in the Sea Org. I mean, it, it, you, get, you, you got better accommodations, to be honest with you. The food was a little bit – I mean, okay, it's prison. It sucks. There, but, but it's not – you're not 
you're not in that in that crazy environment where you have to be working 24 seven, you're not under constant pressure to do anything. You get free healthcare when you're in prison. You get three hot meals a day. I got, I exercised two times a day when I was in prison. I lost 25 pounds. I got in really good shape. And everybody accepted me for being gay when I was in prison, whereas in the Sea Org, I was beaten for it. So it's a huge difference. And doing eight and a half months in prison versus four years in the Sea Org was a piece of cake. Easy. That is incredible. So is this like, you know, a fulsome prison where you're going to get shanked in the yard or what are we talking about? No, 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 no. This is sort of like, I haven't seen Orange is the New Black, but people have compared it to Orange is the New Black. It's very, it's a very relaxed environment. It's all non, non-violent criminals. It's like the so-called white collar uh, club, club fed sort of prison, I guess is what it is. There's no perimeter fence around the prison. It's just sort of like for the for, for the for the people. Uh, when I was there, most of the prisoners that were there that were there for white collar were doctors and pharmacists for uh, committing Medicare fraud, chiropractors for you know sort of doing like some sort of a pharmacy fraud or insurance fraud thing. A couple of embezzlers were in there, financial crimes and stuff like that. And the other half of the population were nonviolent drug offenders. So nobody was dangerous. There were no fights that broke out. Everybody was super super friendly so it, it it was it was not as stressful as some as some people imagine what prison is like right so i guess in orange is the new black um you know when they go to sleep at night they're all in sort of bunk beds and kind of an open um yeah uh i don't know what you would call it or compare it to not like camp but maybe like camp it's like a it's like a big um People call it a Quonset hut, or sometimes they call it like an army barracks or something like that. It's like this giant big open room and there's individual um, pods or cubes is what they call them. And then in each cube, there's two there's two or three bunk beds and you have a, a bunk mate or, or, a, or a, a cube mate or whatever you want to call it. Um, yeah, no, and, and private bathrooms, private showers, it's not like Oz, like where they're all showering in the same you know, room. It's like everything is... Everything is private, and there's no there. There was no violence when I was there. There was really nobody dangerous, as far as I knew. Yeah, it does kind of sound like Orange is the New Black. So in the cubes, in the you said the cubes where the beds are. The cubes go up. They don't go up to the ceiling, right? They go up to like below head level. It's like so, like the each of the cubes they have like a six foot or six and a half foot wall. Um, my cube had a bunk bed, but nobody was in the top bunk, so I was in the bottom bunk, and then there was a separate bed on the opposite wall that my uh, bunkie was in basically. And, we, and I was pretty much in the same queue for the entire time. Yeah, sounds like Orange is the New Black. <laughs> Have you ever, you ever seen that show? No, I haven't seen it yet, but people describe, like when I explain it to them, like, oh yeah, it's just like Orange is the New Black, so yeah. Yeah, except there's definitely a fence around that prison, that's for sure. That, so apparently the one in Orange is the New Black, that's a low security prison. And there was a low security prison next to the camp that, that, that I was at, that's where the, not the super violent criminals, but like the one-time violent criminals, a lot of non-US citizens are there, so they are behind a fence. So the American citizens, the non-violent guys, they were at the camp where there was literally enough. I mean, when, when we were walking around the recreation track, they have basketball courts and tennis courts, and I did yoga on the weekends. They have like yoga classes. When you're walking around the, 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 the park area, like where they have like a, a walking track, you can see the road off the side of the road. Wow. Okay, so your facility was even lower than a low security facility. Mine was the lowest. So a camp is basically the lowest. So that's where all the nonviolent drug offenders go, the white, the white collar guys go. Um, and so if you're there for less than a 10 year sentence, I think is what the maximum is. Um, that's that's basically where everybody goes is they is they go to the camp. Interesting. So what was the schedule like? I mean and again, I find this interesting, not just for people who are like, oh my God, what's prison like? But compared <laughs> to the Sea Org, what was the schedule well, like? Night and day, because at the camp that I was at, there was no schedule. You could, There were guys that slept the entire day and stayed up all night long, literally. So when I first, when I first got there, everybody had the dorms that we stayed in. So like there was like the, the I, I was in uh, B unit, the Bravo unit. There were four units, A, B, C, D, and they didn't lock the doors to the units at night. So you could go out into the rec yard and hang out at the track and literally stay out there all night long. The guards are out there and they're watching you, obviously. You could go in and out and you can pretty much do whatever you want. You can watch TV all day. You can go exercise all day. You can pretty much do whatever the hell you want. 
when I first got there, um, there were two inmates that they didn't escape. I mean, they call it an escape, but they literally just walked away because there's no way to it. it, it they, they just walked down the, the road. Um, so after those two guys left, then they started locking the doors at night. So at night, after I first got there, you had to be in your unit from 10 p.m. to 6 a.m. After that, you can go outside and do pretty much whatever you want. Um, they give everybody a job when in, when I was in when I was there, uh, unless you have a medical reason not to. Uh, so I worked in the kitchen for a couple of months when I was there, which was interesting. Um, so basically, like I worked for for an hour each each meal period, three days a week. So Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, I worked an hour in the morning for breakfast, an hour in the morning, for, an hour in the afternoon for lunch, and then an hour in the evening for for dinner. That was it. And I exercised whenever I wanted to. I didn't, there really is no set schedule. So it's completely different from what, from what the Sea Org is like. Every minute of every day in the Sea Org is accounted for. And the only similarity that I could say between the Sea Org and being in prison, the Sea Org has musters where they make sure that everybody is there when they're supposed to do. Prison has count to make sure that you're still there and that you didn't walk away. So that's really the only similarity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I have wondered how many CIRG members don't quite realize that the only reason for musters is to make sure nobody has escaped. They don't realize <laughs> it. When I was they don't in really it, seem to realize it. And when I was in it, I didn't, I, I didn't realize it either. But I mean, I know now, obviously. So yeah, so that's pretty much the only similarity that I can think of. Incredible. So, um, so the food, how'd the food compare? The food, God, you were at PAC for a while, right? The, yeah. the, food, the food effect sucked when I was there. I heard it got better after I left. Like in the early 2000s, I heard it got a little bit better. But when I was there, the food was terrible. The food in the good thing about prison is that you can they they have a commissary. You can buy your own food. And my prison was a privately owned prison, and it's one of the it was one of the only prisons in the country that let inmates buy fresh fruits and vegetables. So most of the time, I didn't eat in the dining room unless they had like a like you know like something really good like people loved um when they had burgers when they had fried chicken and like the days like that other days the food was kind of shitty but i just bought i bought all my food in the commissary and i made i made food in my in my in, in my cube um so you weren't restricted to only eating at certain periods of the day you could eat when no, you wanted literally eat where and inside the dorms they had microwaves they had like a little kitchen area where you could prepare your own food they had refrigerators they had ice machines so you could pretty much do anything as long as you can do it with a microwave a fridge and some ice which yeah, you can do I mean right there i found I out mean, right there because it's one thing to talk about the quality of food in the sea yeah. it's another thing to talk about penalizing people with uh, regarding food or anything like that or restricting a person's ability to eat you're yeah. not allowed to eat in the sea or outside of the designated meal times without at least getting a report or yeah. having to fucking have an argument with somebody. And then if you get busted or if you fuck up when you're in the CR, you get put on rice and beans. And you're in prison, there's no such thing. And if you and it, it, you you have the option to do either the three meals a day in the dining hall, or you can go buy your food and make and make and make it yourself. You're not forced to do it at a certain time of day. You can go and eat whenever the hell you want, basically. And working in the kitchen, I got special privileges. I could go in and eat whenever I wanted because I had access to go to the back and like hang out with the cooks, essentially. So yeah, wow. no, it's way, it's way, way, way different than the Sea Org. How about how you're treated by the guards? Are they treating you like you piece of shit scum, know your place or whatever? No, the guards have to have some sort of a attitude, I guess, that they have towards inmates. But for the most part, they were perfectly fine. You know, some of them were a little bit meaner than the than the other ones. But if you if you don't mess with them, they don't mess with you. You know, it's sort of it like like and if you do something wrong, obviously you're going to get in trouble for it. But if you just don't get caught, or if you just keep your nose clean, then you should be fine. But oh, I had so many run-ins with PAC security, and like they were, it, it's so crazy now that I think about it. Because like back in the day, they used to come in and they used to search our rooms in main building, like our door, like our building where we would stay. They would just come in and they would toss the place. It's the same thing that they do in prison sometimes. They just come in and say, "Oh well, there's a rumor that one of the inmates brought in cigarettes or brought in alcohol or something." They would go and they would toss their bed and try to and try and try to find the con the contraband this inmate had a cell phone this inmate had a blah 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 you know it's, it's i guess that is another similarity <laughs> well yeah that's what i was going to ask you um as a follow-up is um 
as far as similarities between way the way security treats Sea Org members mm-hmm. and whether it was better or worse than the way prison guards treat prisoners. Yeah. Um, when I left the Sea Org, I've commented on this. Um, it really took me a while to adjust to the concept of civil liberties and why they exist. Yes. Because to me, based on my experience in the Sea Org and based on everything L. Ron Hubbard says about only a criminal would ever object to being investigated, right, of I really had this mindset that you had to be guilty of something to object um, to a search and seizure of your property or whatever. Right. Um, and this concept that like one of the biggest areas looking back on it of cognitive dissonance in the Sea Org mm-hmm. is being told that you're part of the most ethical and valuable group of people in the world, nay, the universe. Yeah. <laughs> and yet the things you are told about yourself and the way you are treated is yeah. as if you are a piece of shit scum prisoner, even yeah. if, even in the best of times. And you feel like that. So, with you feel right. Like- so like, yeah, sorry if I'm. We might have a slight lag. I think I'm accidentally interrupting you. Um, so like, even a Sea Org member who's not in any trouble at all is going to have their birthing inspected and searched sometimes daily. And if not daily, it's only because they couldn't get around to it. Right. To see if you're doing anything or doing it, if you've any evidence that you've been doing anything you shouldn't have been doing, mm-hmm. or if you are in possession of anything you should not be in possession of a computer, Mm -hmm. um, a DVD player, Mm -hmm. some form of television. Uh, What's an example of something else that might be confiscated in a birthing inspection? Uh, Like they had, I I remember they used to catch the, uh, catch the young ranch kids with like those little DVD, like those little portable DVD players. If you had, and then iPods started coming out like in the late, in the late nineties, they confiscated all the iPods, anything that had connection to Wi-Fi, like in the early two, in the early two thousands, when they started having Wi-Fi, um some of the younger gentlemen might have a little lingerie catalog yeah exactly no but i and then um when i was in they they confiscated our music like if the music had swearing in it or if like or if or or if or if there was a particular band or musical group that ever said anything negative about scientology or had a weird lyric that security didn't like they would just take they they would take the cds or they would take like tool yeah exactly I remember there's so many kids that had tool CDs and security came in and just took every single one that they could possibly find. But it's like- For any of the listeners who don't know, there is a lyric in one of their songs that says, fuck L. Ron Hubbard and all of his clones. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) (laughs) But they probably weren't big fans of the hip hop. Oh no, no, they were definitely not fans of that stuff. But the difference is, is that in prison, even the inmates had rights. So like, even if they searched your cube, and they said that they found something, you have recourse to fight whatever guard looked at your thing. And then you can get that, whatever decision that they made for it, if they find contraband in your cube, you get it reversed if you actually didn't have it. In the Sea Org, there's no such recourse. It's your guilty as sin, and there is no way to get out of it. There absolutely is no way to get out of it. Right. Yeah, um, I mean, it would probably be easier for a prisoner to walk off of that camp than it is for a SEERG member at PAC to walk off of the base. Easy, easy. Well, the, and then part of the part of the reason for that is because people who are in prison, they want to get out. <laughs> but in the Sea Org, it's like you're kind of you're just kind of stuck there, and you're 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 in prison up here. So you're like stuck in your own mental mental gate, essentially. Right. It just, uh... Um, it's incredible, incredible. So, um, I don't know what else might someone want to know about the the prison experience. Um, were you able to get have, have visitors, and what were the restrictions on that? Visitors were fine. There was no uh, at at the camp, especially. They didn't search anybody when they were you know going in or out. Um, it's very very relaxed. You can you know they have like a big visiting room. It's perfectly it's perfectly fine. Um. I can make phone calls. I can send emails. Everything is on a relay, of course, with the email because, like, they have to keep a record of everything. Um, and all the phone calls are, you know, recorded. But you get to keep in contact with the outside world, and it was it, it wasn't it wasn't so terrible. It could have been it could have been a lot worse. So, like I said, when I compare the Sea Org versus being in prison, prison is a piece of cake compared to what actually happened to me in the Sea Org. 
Sea Org was torture. Wow. Yeah. And so you guys had internet access in the prison? No internet access, um, just the email. So like we couldn't just we couldn't just go online and Google something if we if we wanted to. They had a college actually. They had like a little annex for a college inside the prison that I was there. So they had computers in there that were connected with the college thing. So you could do research on certain websites for anybody that enrolled in a college course, which I was thinking about doing, but I wasn't there long enough to enroll in the next semester because my, my time was so short. So well, that, uh, that's interesting because I was going to ask about education opportunities. So what yeah. was the whole college thing? Well, the co okay, so the prison is located in Taft, California, which is right next to Bakersfield. And there's a college in the city of Taft. But what they do is they send one of the Taft professors in and they have like a little um, recreation area where there's there's a library. Um, and then there's, a, there's like indoor, there's indoor recreation and outdoor recreation. The indoor recreation had like a pool table. Fools, fools ball table, um, they had dart boards, they had like TVs and stuff like that where you could just kind of hang out and play around in the education center. They had computers and then, the, and then you could sign up for actual college courses. So when you go to federal prison, um, if you don't have a high school diploma, they make you do your GED and they make you get one. So when I first went in, I was like, well, technically I graduated high school, but it was a Scientology school, so it's not an accredited school. So they were like, do you want to get your GED while you're here? I said, sure. I might as well. I have the, I have the time. So I got my GED while I was in prison. Dude. Yeah. It's already <laughs> better than the Sea Org. It's already better than the Sea Org. I actually got a proper real education. So yeah, so you, can, so you do your GED when you're there. And, it, and if I had more time, which thank God I didn't, but if I, if, if I did, I could, I could have signed up for college courses, an actual accredited college, like as an extension, basically. And they have a computer lab and you could do, they have all your books and it's free for the inmates. The only thing you have to pay for are the books, which most people just have their family send the money in. Um, but yeah, no, you can get in, you, you can get an education while you're in prison. It's, it's really good for especially the younger inmates that went in for, you know, minor drug possession. You know, they got caught with a couple bags of marijuana at the border and they got like a four year sentence, which is insane. Um, you know, but for them it's good because they can probably get a proper education and hopefully get a good job when they get out. So. Incredible. Yeah. So in the Sea Org, yeah. um, I kind of want to ask just a blatant question of like, what's the worst thing that happened to you in the Sea Org? But it seems like kind of a stupid question. Um, but what, what do you feel is the worst example of abuse you experienced while in the Sea Org? Oh my God, there's so much of it. Um, I mean, just as just as a couple as a couple of examples, when I first joined the Sea Org, I did my EPF, which is the Estates Project Force. That's the first thing that you do to train you to become a seer member it took me like a week because i'm a very fast student i guess um the first day that i actually was in the sea org i went to my first staff meeting on thursday night and i saw the captain of aola who at the time was stephanie carey slapping really really hard across the face the senior maa at AO at the time i forget her name she's not in the sea org anymore they got into an argument and I was walking down the hall. Stephanie Carey just slapped her really, 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 really hard. That was my first real um, experience of witnessing violence when I was in the Sea Org. And I'll never forget that. And then like every single time I saw something like that afterwards, it just, it stays with you. Cause it's like, before you join the Sea Org, when you, you think about Sea Org members, they're the most ethical, like you said, they're the most ethical beings on the planet. They get shit done. They're like the most OT people, the most capable, capable, high powered people in the universe. And I've seen seared members, but there was this one guy and they were doing some sort of an all hands thing. And like they needed all these seared members to stay up way late into the wee hours of the morning to try to get something done. And this elderly seared member who was in his 70s said, no, I'm old. I'm going to bed. You know, he's on a he's on an exact sleep schedule. And the, the younger guy punched the 70, 72 or 73 year old man in the face because he really, was, yeah. You don't remember who that was? I don't remember who that was. He used to be a, a knots auditor at AO. Um, and then of course, when the new knots auditors, like the new wave of the golden age of tech members, he got demoted and became an admin person, you know, in the, somewhere in the back. But 
I don't remember who that was. And then at Flag, I saw people getting into fights all the all, all the all the time. People were just so miserable at Flag, and everybody was sleep everybody was sleep deprived and constantly stressed out. Do you remember Dominic O'Brien? Yeah, Dominic O'Brien was the chief officer AOLA when I was there. Yeah, so he got he he got busted at at, at one time for falsifying stats. Um. It was the um, the VSD, which was the which was the statistic value service delivered. He, I guess, he was going into people's uh, case folders and like marking up the number of hours that 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 they were actually getting. He was closing out intensives. He was closing out intensives to to try to get his st statistics up. A lot of CR members did that because the pressure to keep your statistics up is so high. You will lie, cheat, and steal to do whatever you possibly can. To keep your stats up otherwise you get creamed so one time at staff meeting he was wearing like an old battered t-shirt and like pants with holes in them he obviously got busted for it so the so the person who was the rtc rep at the time i, for, I forget his name he had him by the collar and like dragged him into in front of the entire staff of aola and made him confess his crimes in front of the entire crew and i felt so I felt so terrible for him, but it's like they, they humiliated him. And yes, he obviously he did something wrong because he was under so much pressure to keep his stats up and stuff like that happened all the time. So like the, that accumulation of like all those little things and then like Paige Kemper, you remember Paige Kemper, the sweet little old lady who was one of the CSs, she got busted for miscalling a floating needle in one of her sessions. So they did this thing. I mean, I'm sure people have heard of people in Scientology throwing people overboard when he when LRH used to be on the ship. They used to literally toss students over the side into the ocean. We're not in an ocean at pack. So they took her out into the back, into the VRU, which is that little trashy area in the back. And they did the they did the overboarding um, ceremony, I guess is whatever you want to call it. They sprayed her with a hose while she was fully clothed in front of the entire technical team, all of the auditors, all of the CSs, all of the supervisors. And she said, I'm sorry for committing the crime of falsifying a, a meter read, a, a floating needle, I think is what it was. And I promise I'll never do it again. And then the ethics officer just took a hose and just started hosing her down. Just complete humiliation. And it's like, and nobody said anything about it. And I'm looking around at everybody like, what the fuck is going on with this? This is the most embarrassing dehumanizing, humiliating thing I've ever seen in my life. But I saw so I saw so much of it over the four years that I was in there. It just it just nobody ever said anything about it. Yeah, and that's fucking crazy. crazy. I had so, heard of the overboarding. I had heard of the overboarding also being done by throwing buckets of water on people. Um, I never saw that happen because it sounded like that happened mostly at AOLA and for the most of my time at Pack Guy was at Ash Show. Yeah. Um <clears throat> but 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 what is incredible is that the auditors at AOLA are all older people. They're all uh, because it takes a lot longer to be trained as a class nine auditor, especially when you're doing it the right way before David Miscavige let everyone do it the short way. Yeah. Um, but you know they're they're in their sixties and their seventies. They're in their sixties and their seventies, and they're working seven days a week from you know seven a.m. or eight a.m. until ten p.m. or eleven p.m. I mean, they're working completely non nonstop. Twice when I was a public at AO, two of the auditors um, that was giving me auditing at the time, on several occasions, they would fall asleep in the middle of the session with me because they're so fucking exhausted. And it's like they sit there and they audit people day in and day out and do the same thing every single day. I, I, it's it's just it's so it's so it's so exhausting and i felt so bad for them it's like I, I didn't want to say anything because i knew that if i said something to one of the other tech staff they would get busted for for falling asleep in the middle of the session i chose to ignore it and just didn't say anything i mean it, it, it was it was really really sad that's a great point yeah. um even mike rinder or maybe it was marty rathman um back in the day was talking about um ray midoff oh the, yeah top auditor case supervisor in the entire world he's the number one guy and like as far as the i don't mean i don't mean like you got an award for being the best for the people who are watching tech in the organizational structure of scientology ray Madoff is the most senior technical person in scientology 
falling yes. asleep while doing auditing sessions because the Sea Org members yeah. at Int are under the same or worse conditions as the Sea Org members at the continental level. Probably, probably worse because David Miscavige is their boss. Right. Yeah. Right. Totally. You know, I have um, speculated, I know for this is certainly true for me personally, mm -hmm. that the majority of the violent outbursts that occur in the Sea Org mm -hmm. um, are attributable to lack of sleep and all of the ramifications, all of the personality um, ramifications that come from not from being chronically unrested. Yes. Uh, I know that when me and the captain would come to screams and uh, sometimes blows, me and John Lundine, it was almost always when I had rolled out of bed 15 minutes ago, had dressed, eaten, uh, quickly gathered my paperwork to show up to the morning product conference meeting. Mm -hmm. And he wants to start screaming at me or being snide or making some fucking comment. And I just like had no fuse at that point. I'm like, you want to go, motherfucker? We're going to go. <laughs> oh, God. You know, I actually just remembered this other thing that happened, too. Um, do you Were you there in, like, 98 or 99? The RTC rep at the time was Mr. Reese. Um, Jesse. Jesse Reese. So he was the, R he was the RTC rep uh, for PAC. And he decided to do this thing called the Upstack Club and the Downstack Club. Um, so basically what he did was, is he went around the entire base over a period of several weeks and he would take candid pictures, you know, just with like a regular camera, take candid pictures of various Sea Org members doing either good things or doing bad things. So like he came into my course room one time and he was just standing there doing an inspection. I was souping the solo course room at, at that time. And he just took a, just took a picture of me and then just left. I was like, what the fuck was that? Okay. Um, and then one night for base briefing, when every CR member in the entire pack base, he had a giant screen put, put up and he did like a little slideshow. Here's all the downstep people. So he started like going through the slideshow of CR, of mostly CR members slacking off. And one of the, and one of the pictures that he put was Edie Lundeen, who at that time was the captain of AO in the middle of post walking in the main building to get her, to get her dry cleaning. So he slit, so he changes it to the slide and here's like, here's Edie Lundine during post time getting her dry cleaning. She's a fucking downstat. And then of course, all of the pack base were like, boo, boo, and like, just, just bashing her to shit. And then my slide shows up and like, oh, here's Joey Chate supervising his students. And he, he's an upstat. Yay, everybody, yay, 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 yay. And then I think I got like, um, what did I get? It was like a five or $10 gift card to, I don't even remember what the fuck it was for, but like you get a little reward or whatever. It is. But like it's shit, it's shit like that. It's just not only are you physically exhausted, you're mentally broken. And it, 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 there, and the combination of those two things, it just has to destroy people. And Edie was so old and she was anemic and she was physically ill. And she literally was working 24 seven at AO to try to keep it. And then one day in the middle in the in the middle of the day, they took her they took her off her post and shipped her off to the RPF. And she's supposed to run around in these heavy workout boots in a in a black jumpsuit, doing heavy manual labor, getting maybe five or six hours of sleep at night as a 65-year-old or as a 70-year-old who's physically terribly ill. And she was right. on the RPF for like three years or four years. And someone who'd been in the Sea Org for Decades, five or forty years. She was in the Sea Org during when LRH was on the Apollo in the nineteen sixties. I mean, she yeah. she's been in since the beginning. Uh, and then, it's one of these. Uh, and no, then they keep going. going. Keep going. Well, after uh, after they took Edie out, they swooped in Angelo Scassi, and that's a whole other fucking mess. Is what happened with Angelo, who became the captain of AO, and talk about child molestation and statutory rape. Oh my God, it's just crazy. Um, uh, looking back, it's one of those things like the, the story that you mentioned of at base briefing, mm -hmm. having uh, a, a 20 year old punk kid like Jesse, who, who's oh. in RTC, one of the most senior people on the base, other than maybe the one person he answered to, he probably had a senior RTC rep to him. It was probably Ann, Ann Rathbun, who was, yeah. Here. So I didn't get to pack until 2002 until after Jesse had already been RPF. You have. Um, on Sully Stolly. Yeah, I so I was there when Mr. Uh, Mr. Quelo 
and Mr. Tyra. So Marta Coelho and Leslie Tyra were the two um, RTC reps. And compared to what I've heard previously, they were sweethearts. I mean, I actually really liked them. Yeah. I never um, met them. Yeah. That was and after. so when you tell the story of, you know, Jesse, literally, probably, probably 20 years old. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Early 20s. And he's ridiculing the captain of ALA at base briefing. So for the followers, it would be like, I, I, I'm mentioning this because you, you, when you say this, I'm like, wow, talk about undermining any sense of yeah. respect or authority. Mm -hmm. And where RTC, the only one RTC cares about having any sort of presence or altitude is RTC. Mm -hmm. And anyone else can suck a dick. Yeah. So it's like, it would be like if you had, you were in a high school and you mm -hmm. were having, um, a, what do they call it? Not an event, an assembly. And the superintendent came to the assembly and mm -hmm. ridiculed the principal yes. in front of all of the students. Yes. And then expected the principal to go on doing his job. Exactly. No, that's 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 a really good analogy of it. It's like, but that happened on a weekly, on a daily or a weekly, a weekly basis. There was always somebody getting in in, in trouble. There was always somebody getting busted, and they parade them around in front of all the staff to humiliate humiliate the shit out of them as part of their what they call an ethics grade. Yeah. And then and then it, it, oh god, it was it was it was awful. Did you know Huck Taylor, Huckleberry Taylor? I remember Huck Taylor, yeah. So Huck was such a good kid, such a good guy at heart, and he was such he was he was he was a funny guy. He was so funny. He he was such a good hard worker who, in some ways, took pride in what he did, and in other ways, just wanted to be a fuck off kid. <laughs> so that's all we wanted to do. <laughs> and so he wound up racking up a debt at the local blockbuster oh, because yeah. on saturday nights or whatever he would run down the street rent movies and never return them <laughs> and so but and created some sort of a flap regarding fucking blockbuster <laughs> so but and and he was a minor and would like he was caught drinking wine or something like i don't know how huck got his hands on a bottle of wine but huck will do what huck will do <laughs> and so at this point he's probably still 16 Yes. And he gets brought up in front of a base briefing. Oh, no. Poor Huck. Oh. And ridiculed while standing in front of, what, five, six hundred people uh, talking about his, um, um, the movies. And I don't know if they were X-rated movies or whatever. Um, but, you know, whatever it was he was being dressed down for, it was worse than whatever he actually did. Yeah. And he was just fucking a sobbing mess afterwards, this 16-year-old oh, kid. Sure. And you're like, okay, 16, he's not like a baby. You're like, yeah, if 600 people of We're, people who you're trying to earn their respect. Right. And most of these guys, especially the young steering members, they're all his friends. He lives with them. He work, they, they spend 24-7 with each other. They, it, oh, man. Yeah. And there were so many other kids, especially at, at, at Astro, there were a lot of the younger ranch kids that – went through their that went through their training i heard so many stories about like these 13 14 15 16 year old sierra members running around in the middle of the night like going to like i used to go remember ken doherty yeah he used to wake me up in the middle of the night at like 12 30 or 1 in the morning after i had already gone to bed and like hey because i had a car he's like hey joey can i can i like borrow your car he used to go down and play video games at the at the arcade in the middle of the night and these are minors without any parental supervision running around in Hollywood, in East Hollywood, going out in the middle of the night doing God knows what. It's like, they just let them do whatever the fuck they wanted. As long as they showed up to post the next day, it didn't matter. How would he get out? Um, I, I mean, there's no fence around PAC, but how there, would he manage to get to the car and drive away without being stopped by security? A couple of times um, that I actually went with him. <laughs> um, once or twice the security guard would be like where the fuck are you guys going and we would say like oh we're going on a, we're going on a recruitment cycle or we're like going on like a reg cycle basically like we're going to see a public to try to get them to either join the sea org or to ask for more money for their services oh, okay fine go 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 didn't didn't care that it was one o'clock in the morning or whatever they, they, they didn't they didn't give a shit and do you remember uh juliana uh shape 
Oh, yeah. She did one of my, her little hateful videos on the website they put up about me. Oh, God damn you, Juliana. Uh, I love I love her to pieces, but she ew, she's in it. So we used to <laughs> we used to um, we would have lunch at the same time and dinner at the same time. We would walk into to like the main dining room at the same time and we'd look at the food to, together and then we'd look up and then we'd look at each other and be like, we'll get the fuck out of here. And we would go to Wendy's or to Taco Bell or because I had the car. And a couple of times he got stopped by security, but it's, uh, I told him I had, I was, uh, I was allergic to chili and cornbread or whatever the hell garbage that they were serving at the main mess or something. But you're like, I, I'm allergic to shit food. I'm allergic to garbage food. I love Juliana though. I really hope, God, I hope she, I, she, she wakes up one day. No, I, I mean, I had a great relationship with Juliana. That's one of the reasons why I was so disgusted. I mean, not so much hurt as disgusted as the things she said. I'm like, dude, you were like, of all the friends I had in the sea, or you were damn near the top, you fucking piece of shit. Yeah, she told she. I first met her at Flag when we were both on the on the TTC program. To to and she, ooh, she told me some stories about how like the shit that went down when they were growing up at the ranch and like what those kids were doing. She told me everything, and I it's it boggled my mind because I didn't I, I didn't grow up in the Sea Org. I was a public until I was eighteen, and then I joined. And I was like, I had no idea that crazy shit was going on. It's just, it's nuts. Yeah. And as far as life in the Sea Org, I mean, Juliana was already married and divorced three times, probably before the age of 30. Mm -hmm. That's just no big deal. Just normal. You yeah. Know? Mm. <clears throat> um, so what were some of the circumstances? You said that you had been um, assaulted a few times in the Sea Org. What's yeah. an example of something that like precipitated that? The first time, the first time that I ever was physically assaulted in this year was back. I was there for about five or six months, and then I was like, "I hate this place. I hate Florida. I want to go. I want to go back to LA." Um, the ethics officer, who was the flag ethics officer, his name was Emil something. Yeah, it was Emil Roest. Was it? Well, Emil Roest, but his full name was Jens Emil Roest. You know, short little Danish Swedish looking guy. Yeah, um, yes. yeah. yeah. Nice yeah. guy, unless he didn't want to be, but otherwise kind of mild mannered. So, so he was, he was the devil as far as really? he did not like me at all. Well, number one, I, I told him that I wanted to leave to go back to LA. So he took, so he like took, he, there's so many times he fucking threw shit at me or he slapped me in the face or punched me. This is what the Sierra will do to people. Yeah, no, it's good. Yeah, so he, he took me to his office in the Coachman building. Um, and he was like, I think you want to fucking leave the Sea Org. I don't think you want to go back to LA. I think you're going to go back to LA and just fucking blow, right? I'm like, no, I really want to stay in the Sea Org, which I did at the time. But I want to go back to LA. Like, I don't like it here. I don't like flag. I don't like Florida. He took his desk lamp and flung it at my face and barely, like, missed my face, essentially. He got so pissed off. And so I was, of course, then put in 24-7, like, ethics watch. Like, I was in his office writing up my Overton withholds, or I was going to go eat in the, in the Clearwater building where the, where the chow hall was. And then a couple of times, like, I went to the bathroom. Like, I remember going to the bathroom once, and I was gone for, like, 20 minutes. I had to take a shit. And so I went to the bathroom, and I came back. He's like, where the fuck have you been? And he gra like, grabs me by the scruff of my thing, and he pushes me up against the wall. He's like, don't you ever fucking go to the bathroom without ever telling me again. Like, I, you know, you're a piece of shit. You're this, you're that. Screaming at me in front of the whole, uh, uh, not the whole, but like a, a lot of the other students that were studying there at the time, which some of them were public. Anyway, yeah, so that was like my first taste of like, the the brunt of uh, and he slapped me in the face a, a couple of times my grandfather was sick in the hospital he had he had a stroke and i told him I, I wanted to go back to la he said he didn't believe me and he and he said that i was one one and that i was a piece of shit and that i was a, j a joker and a joke he, he called he called me everything he called me every name you could possibly think of so that was the first like holy shit i gotta get out of here like this is nuts so when you um we're interacting with Emil or whenever that was. Yeah. Did, did he still have his counterpart, Thomas, on the other side of the ethics office? He, he, Thomas was there. He was the Hungarian guy, I think, right? Um, he looked like some member of the Aryan race. I don't know. <laughs> I remember there was a tall Hungarian guy named Thomas or Thomas or yeah, something. Yeah, but like he was a, he was a, he was like a younger big dude. He wasn't like some slender. No. Just, 
I don't think I remember a big dude. No. Okay. No. He might've already gone to the RPF. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. This was 96 or 97, I think when I was a flag. For real? Then we just missed each other. We may have. Yeah. Cause I think you came just after me. No, no. Well, I was there from 93 to May 96. And then I came back for six months in 98. We may have just, we may have like just missed like, so like it sounds like you got the flag shortly after the golden age of tech supervisors left. Very very shortly yeah. after, yeah. Because I wasn't I wasn't in the Sea Org for that first wave. I was there for the like the second wave. Right, right. Okay, so you didn't see when I was in at Flag with Emil Tomas, mm -hmm. or was the one who was like a suit like real quick like roid rage kind of dude. <laughs> Whereas Emil was kind of like the gentle little librarian fellow. <laughs> I saw him be gentle. I mean, I saw him be gentle with me at first, and then I saw him be gentle with other Sierra members. But I got I got under his skin somehow. I don't know what I did to upset him. I don't know what I said, but he just did not like me. He threw the lamp in my face. He's throwing a book. He threw, he threw the ethics book at me and like hit me in the stomach, slapping, grabbing by the thing, shoving up against the wall. Like all kinds of all kinds of crazy shit with him happened. Yeah, and so for the followers, they should understand the guy we're talking about is the guy in charge of ethics. Yes, he's supposed to set an example for being the most ethical seer member in the entire place, and he's supposed to get ethics in, right? As, as they say, yeah, no, yeah. That, like this is not considered uh, Emil's conduct is not considered unethical. There's right. one reference called the ethics officer, his character, or the. Uh, and and there's other, there's like two or three main references that are used um, to sort of train ethics officers in sort of why it's okay to be a dick. <laughs> yeah, basically. <laughs> and you know, being a real asshole to someone, or even laying your hands on them in the CR at least, is not considered unethical. Right. If anything, it's considered what's necessary to wake you up and get you walking the straight path like the ends justifies the means what whatever it is that scares you straight and gets you start acting like a good sea org member is by definition ethical or you know the right way to do it or whatever right um yeah so that was that was my that was my first uh encounter with violence in the sea org there were well, a couple you know what emil's been doing for the last 15 years for the last 15 years Emil has been demoted to the position of bus driver. <laughs> oh, Jesus. <laughs> I see him all the time, dude. And I you're... see him at the gas station filling up the flag bus. Yeah. I, I'll pull up to an intersection and Emil's, uh, you know, because sometimes he drives the airport van. And so I'll oh. sometimes pass the airport van on the causeway. And it's always fucking Emil. Emil's always driving the bus. Well, thank God he's not in a position of power anymore because that was just, that was so fucked up what he did to me. Yeah, that is fucked up. Did, did he see you? Like, do you like actually like... I don't look anything like I did back then. Okay. There, there are still people from back then who can recognize me, but if, if I mean, I full on had conversations with Sea Org members at the local gas station and they have no fucking idea who I am. I mean, <laughs> I, I pulled up to put some air into my motorcycle tires and this um this ias reg who i know <laughs> wandering up he's like nice bike man i bet this i bet it's real fun to ride right he's like i'm like yeah you don't know who i am <laughs> oh, <my God. laughs> and i don't tell them either i'm not trying to be antagonistic or weird there's nothing you can say you're just the wasting maker. your time Saying things like that, you do live in the mecca of near, near the mecca of Scientology, <laughs> right? <laughs> I live in the city with the most, the highest concentration of Scientologists in the world, which I think there's only like five or six thousand of them here, and most of them are probably Sierra members. Totally, yeah, totally, yeah. Um, well, is there anything else about the Sierra experience that you think is worth commenting on? We covered every, I think, mostly everything. Um, there i mean there's so many there's so many stories and like it's weird too because i still remember shit that i forgot and i've obviously been getting a lot of therapy in the last couple of years to like try to like fix this whole thing and like try to try to come to terms with everything that happened and it's like and i start to like remember all this all this other crazy stuff and I'm like like the like the throwing her overboard and like pete 
uh, spraying Paige with a hose. I I haven't thought about that in years. So like, there's still there's still stuff coming out. There's still there's still a lot of a lot of crazy stories that I have yet to tell. <laughs> I'm yeah. sure you've experienced the same thing. Like it's like those little little things that happen every once in a while that just kind of. Yeah, I mean, for me, what I struggle with, and again, I don't even know that struggle is the right word because it doesn't feel like a struggle, but yeah. that's almost my point. Yeah, is that in retrospect, when I look back on all of it, yeah, it doesn't seem so distant. It doesn't seem so foreign. Mm -hmm. It doesn't seem like something that damaged me. Okay. Um, and so there's one video where I said I feel like I tend to look back on all of it with sort of rose-colored glasses, okay. and and yet, when I examine it closely and think about specific incidents, I'm like, fuck. Like, do you know what I mean? Like, so yeah. I guess what I'm saying is what, what I struggle with is, um, is in, in some sense coming to terms with how unusual and how unnatural and how unnormal mm -hmm. something that to me was just life yeah. was. Yeah, because I don't, for the most part, I don't feel like or act like um, my experience is something I've had to recover from. Mm -hmm. Okay, I don't feel like a terribly different person than I was back then. I don't feel like my values are much different. I just feel like I've examined it and gone, yeah, that's not true anymore, yeah. and mo and moved on. Yeah. And so, and I, I don't want to just ramble here, but. But so, but it's very easy for me to come off a little flippant and a little dismissive of, let's say, how unnatural or how harmful this experience was um, in my developmental years. Mm -hmm. I think one of the reasons I have the luxury of being a little dismissive of it is because things in life have turned out for me rather well. So mm -hmm. there's not a lot of blame, shame, and regret of what I have gone through. True. Do, do you, I mean, I hope that makes sense. Now, I, I, I look at you and I go, you, your family's always been very successful. You were very successful in Scientology. Um, and, and maybe this is a question I should ask you. How much, oh, but, and also you didn't join the Sea Org until you were 17 and it was four years and it was four shitty years. Yes. How, how much of what, well, and, and actually in this interview, you and I haven't even had a chance to talk about what growing up in Scientology meant for someone in your, in your, in your experience. Yeah. So, but for you, how much do you look back on, let's say, your auditor training? Yeah. Um, because you've done a shitload of it before you joined the Sea Org. How much do you look back on all that? And and how much does it seem like that has harmed you overall, or how much does it seem like maybe it's helped, or how do you even process it? What do you take away from it? Well, I'm still working that out. Um, most of it I kind of have figured out, and I think I I think. Compared to other people, I was one of the very lucky ones to, number one, to come out of Scientology and come out of the Sea Org alive. I was close friends with Aaron Poulin, you know, and he committed suicide because he felt like he had to escape the Sea Org and probably other things. Um, so growing up in Scientology before the Sea Org, it was very, very different for, for me because my parents were rich. They donated a shit ton of money to Scientology. I got to go to all of the Celebrity Center gala events. I got to go to the main voyage events on the free winds. I got to hang out with David Miscavige. I got to hang out with all the int execs like Guillaume Lasserve and Ray, and, and Ray Midoff and Norman Starkey. They would come to my house when I was a kid. They used to show up at like, like late at night to try to get money out of my parents. So in that aspect, it was very different. You sort of feel like almost like a Scientology VIP. I mean, at least I did when I was a kid. At, at the time when I did a, when I did all that all that training, it was a much easier, happier time. It was the late '80s and it was the early '90s. The economy was doing really, really well. A lot of Scientologists had a lot of money, at least the ones that we hung out with. There wasn't horrible pressure to donate that much money. There wasn't this crazy like um, ethics, like heavy ethics environment around that time when I was a kid. So I thought it was a fucking blast when I was younger. We would go to the, the free winds and we would like go off, off roading, you know, in like a four wheel drive Jeep in the beach with um, David, David Miscavige's wife and uh, the captain of the free winds is Mike Napier. Yep. And his son at the time, who was the same age as us. 
John or there's a few. Yeah. And like, and like, and, and we would go and like, we would go gambling with, with a bunch of Sierra members on like the, on in the, in the Bahamas and in the Caribbean. It was, it was a fun time. There was all the fancy parties and the black tie events and stuff. Um, so that part of it, like, I feel like it wasn't so, it wasn't so crazy, but then the Sea Org came in and then that's when things started to go downhill very, very, very fast. And then after, at, even after I left the Sea Org and I tried to get back into that whole aspect of it, I was regged to death. I got such heavy, heavy ethics, even as a public afterwards. And it just got worse and worse and worse. And finally it was like, that's it. I can't, I can't, I can't take it anymore. You know, you said something there that I think is a really great point. Um, and it had to do with it being a different, happier, more prosperous time. Yes. So it occurred to me, I was just thinking of this earlier today, mm -hmm. that there was, um, wh when was the IES started? Like 86-ish? 80 somewhere, something. Yeah. Somewhere around the time LRH died. I forget when the, I'm not good with these dates. Yeah, it was okay. like 87. So let's take it from 86 or 87. Mm -hmm. And then when did Tom Cruise get his medal? 2004? something like that yeah it was like 2005 i think maybe it could have been five okay 2006 okay so up until 2000 let's say five mm -hmm. the highest award status the ias mm -hmm. had mm -hmm. was patron meritorious which was only two hundred and fifty thousand dollars. yeah now i don't i know you're like oh my god that's a lot of money yeah that's a lot of money but yeah. that means the ias didn't even recognize that it was possible or likely for anybody to give over a quarter million. Correct. And now the biggest award is like 75 million. So it wasn't until just after Tom got his award that they introduced the silver meritorious and the gold meritorious and platinum and then, meritorious and then the platinum mer meritorious maximus and the fucking like, <laughs> with honors <laughs> with honors, like 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 the galactic overlord platinum diamond whatever the i don't know what it's called but it, it's right so not only in the 90s um did you have scientologists had a lot more money but there was a lot less demand for it there wasn't people expecting you to donate 10 million dollars to the ias yeah um you were not <clears throat> i mean really people and, and even the number of people who had donated a quarter million dollars were were rare they were like unicorns <laughs> very good very rare. and then when i when i'm when i'm thinking about it now all the 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 big scientology donors that we all used to hang out with in the 80s and the 90s except for like a very small handful of them they're all broke or dead totally totally and you didn't have the ideal org strategy nope. and so um and so I'm, I'm mentioning this because um you know we see things getting a lot um uh, in ways a lot we see that things have gotten a lot worse a lot more militaristic a lot um i'll just say a lot worse under miscavige and yes. i think this is part of it the part of it is stats are truly down things are truly desperate he yeah. is acting out yeah. he has to blame everyone around him for being pieces of shit because he has to blame someone for the stats being so bad exactly and you have the people, like you said, the the the, the whales from the '90s are either broke or dead, mm -hmm. and yep. there's only so many of them today. There's only um, there's only a handful of them. Like I can maybe count on one hand the amount of whales that are continuing to still donate to Scientology. That's basically it. There's little pieces here and there that they get from a couple little minor guys, you know, like maybe a couple thousand, maybe ten or twenty thousand here and there, and that adds up, but the guys who are donating millions and millions of dollars that are carrying the weight of five or six people. Yeah, and you know what's gonna happen. A lot of these rich guys, mm -hmm. um, they're not just donating with cash that they have. I mean, aside from the Duggins. The Duggan is don Duggan, Bob and Trish are donating from money that they have. Mm -hmm. But who was the guy who um, he owned, oh, there's, there's a few different Latin American families that to me, I get their names all mixed up. It's not the Agamis, it's, was it the it might be the Acuntos? Oh, There's Richie. one guy who went totally bust. Oh, yeah. Did Richie Acunto go broke? Last I heard, he went completely broke. And I think he was selling his IAS trophies on eBay or something like that. No, no. What happened is he didn't pay the rent on his storage unit. Oh, Jesus. Oh. And so all the shit he had in there wound up on eBay. Okay, gotcha. And so someone like Richie, he was, he wouldn't, 
he, he didn't, wouldn't have gone broke if he was only donating what he had. He was leveraged. He was highly leveraged. And, you know, these guys, um, and then they try to declare bankruptcy and the church steps in and says, you can't do that. Mm -hmm. yep. You can't declare bankruptcy because then they audit your records and see who you gave your money to. And then they come after us for a return of donations. Yeah. So uh, the church has made many people reverse their bankruptcies. I know it's crazy. And it's crazy that they can do that with their, with their, fi with their financials and like tell people what to do as far as their, as far as their money goes. It's like, and they're still coming after my parents to this day. They're still trying to rake my parents over the phone, even though my parents are now broke from, you know, my dad's health, sit my dad's health situation and the gallery not doing nearly as well as it used to be. Like there's still, you know, since my mother has now probably cut me out of any money that they have left, which I don't think is anything. When she dies and when my dad dies there, she's probably going to sign her everything over to the IS is what she said to one of the lawyers that she is working with. Wow. So it's like, there's, there's this little old lady, this poor little old lady, my mother, you know, they're really, they're just going, they're, they're, they're going for the gold. So your dad, uh, despite being an OT eight and was he a class eight, class eight auditor? He didn't do too much training. He did, uh, like up to class five back in the seventies or the okay. eight or something. Okay. And you know, his solo stuff, but that's basically it. He wasn't really much of a training guy. He was more of like an auditing guy. So he's fallen on to some hard health situations. Very, 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 very hard. Do you want to give just a, because I wanted to lead into after everything that's happened with your father and his personal health, mm -hmm. after everything that's happened with the business, after everything that happened with you ended up having to go to prison, mm -hmm. is he really still sitting there choosing Scientology over his family? I'm not going to answer that question because be, because that I, I will hopefully let him answer that one of these days. Um, but I'll tell you a story. Uh, when he first had a heart attack, this was like three years ago or four years ago, and he collapsed, he died, and the ambulance came, they paddled him, his heart started again. He was in a coma for about three or four months, I think. So when he first went to the hospital, this happened while he and my mom were in San Francisco. He was in a hospital at San Francisco, and this was before I got, to, uh, before I got declared. My mother was trying desperately to, to try to get Flag or CC because my parents were considered celebrities. So they dealt with Susan Watson in the president's office to try to get an auditor to come and give him assist to try to wake him up from this, from this coma. She couldn't get one fucking person out there. I called Susan Watson like a week or two after he was in the coma. And I was like, Susan, these fucking people have been in Scientology for 40 years. They've donated millions of dollars. You need to, if my mom wants a fucking auditor, you get one out here. Yeah, Joey, you're right. I know. I'm so, so sorry. We're working on it. We're going to get someone out there. And then nothing happened until my mom wrote a letter to David Miscavige. And then a month later or two or two, or two months later, after he got transferred from San Francisco back to Cedars in, in LA, then they finally sent out an auditor to come and like start giving him assists and stuff like that. So it's like, if that happened in any other church or any other religion, the church, the 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 pastor, the the rabbi, the the priest, they would be there at the hospital with the entire con congregation. What do you need? Can we bring you food? Do you need any money? Do you need any of this stuff? Not one fucking peep from the from Scientology. Right. And so that's the so that's the type of people that 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 they are. They do not give. They only take. It's incredible. It's incredible. And even in the cases where they do, like I think Jason Begay told his story when he flipped his car and got, he flipped a convertible and got into some serious, he, he was died. in serious trouble. He nearly died. And I think Tommy Davis was like daily at the side of his bed. And you're like, well, yeah, one, it's because you knew he still had tons of money to give you. <laughs> yes. And two, the moment Jason Begay started to speak out, they used the fact that they had actually paid attention to him against him. Like, <laughs> like what kind of piece of trash must you be to turn against the best friends you had in the world who were there by your bedside? You're like, yeah, yeah, we're religious. Guys. Oh, fucking course. Oh my God. So yeah. So my dad, he, he's bless it, bless his heart, but yeah, he's got, uh, he's, he's got some medical, he's, he's got some medical issues, but I don't think he's, I don't think he's been in session or gotten any assist in the last, at least the last year or two, as far as, as far as I know, from what he said, but you know, right.
No. Um, okay, I thought one last question I could ask you before we end off. Um, so yeah. you're, were you raised Jewish? Say that one more time, you froze for just a second. Were you raised Jewish? Yes, I had a, I had a bar mitzvah. I went to temple. I did the I did the whole thing. So despite the fact though that you were born into Scientology, how the fuck does that work? Oh, it's so fucked up. So okay, my dad's parents were Orthodox Jews. So my so we did Scientology was our real re religion, but Judaism was this thing that we did just to sort of appease our grandparents. You know, so we said, and, and, you know, when I was still in the family, we still, we still celebrated Hanukkah. We had Shabbat dinners on Friday night at my parents' house nearly every single week. It was more of like a traditional thing. Like we didn't really pray or anything like that. But when we did go to temple for the high holidays or when I had my bar mitzvah, you know, it was sort of like, this is just this chore that you have to do to keep grandparents who are super Orthodox Jew. So, right, right. But, I've tried to explain that because it's a very common question. It's we, really... Um, it was really, really weird, but you know, and I felt bad for my grandparents because they loved us and I knew that they had a problem with Scientology, but they didn't really say anything because they didn't want to cause any, cause any garbage. So, you know, but I, we sort of, we sort of did it for them. So Judaism, of course, includes a belief in God. Yeah. Did you grow up believing in God? Uh, in some sort of sense. Yeah. And then in Scientology, you have a vague definition of what God might be, which is part of the eight dynamics, but it, it, uh, when I was younger, I didn't believe in that type of God that you find in the Torah, basically. It was sort of like, oh, yeah, it's just this thing, you know, we don't know what it is, but, you know, it's not really real. Scientology is really the only thing that you need to worry about. Did your parents ever say one way or the other, um, the Torah is true, the Torah is not true? They never said that, but um, when when I got to OT3... And when everybody gets to OT3, you learn that the majority of this of stuff that that is written in the Bible, those stories are part of that implant that you get at 75 million years ago. You get God and you get Jesus and you get the devil and like all this other biblical, you know, shit. It's all made up stories. It's all part of the implant. So LRH said that the Torah is garbage, the Old Testament, the New Testament, whatever testament you want, it's all part of an implant. So... Right. So based on these false electronically implanted memories that we all have in common, we have as a as a human race, we create these stories and legends and parables based on the implanted memories we all have in common. Yeah. Is that how you take it? That's how I took it. Yeah, that's absolutely how I took it. So and I sort of I sort of thought the same thing because that's what my my parents never said it openly, but that's how, how they sort of treated it. So it was just kind of this thing like, well, you can just sit there and, you know, you can do the, you know, you can do the, the Jewish prayers or do whatever you want because you learn them as part of your bar mitzvah, but you never really got any spiritual sustenance out of it. The only spiritual enlightenment that you will ever get is with Scientology is what they, is what they told me. Interesting. So um, because we just went through the holidays um, on the supporters of the Remedy page, people are always asking, why do Scientologists celebrate Christmas? Why do Scientologists celebrate Christmas? Yeah. And I'm like, why does any American who doesn't believe in God celebrate Christmas? But I tried to explain, there's two kinds of Scientologists. Those who celebrate Christmas mm -hmm. and those who celebrate Hanukkah. <laughs> <laughs> because there, there were a lot of, of Israeli Scientologists and a lot of Jewish Scientologists. And I remember every single year, it was the, um, the McFarlands would have their Christmas party. And then um, the Friedmans, Richard and Judy Friedman, they would have their, they would have their Hanukkah party. And we, would, and, and we would go to both. Very big Scientology. I think, the, I think um, uh, Sue McFarland died a couple of years ago, I think. Anyway, so, she, so they would have the Christmas party. They were big Scientologists. They did the survival insurance thing. Um, and then the Freedmans would have their Hanukkah party, and we would and we would go to both. You can celebrate it as like a holiday, but it's an American holiday. It's not a religious holiday. So right. that's I was always and and I, I felt like in retrospect thinking about why did I have this opinion? It's because I spent so much time at Flag, and there are so many um, Eastern Europeans at Flag. It always seemed like there was a lot of Israelis. There were a and lot of. <laughs> how, how did this come to be? Like, no. not even just Jewish people, yeah. literally people from Israel. Israelis, yeah. It's, I don't know how that happened. 
it just sort of became like this really large group of is Israeli people. And I think a lot of Israelis, um, the Shadowskis, I remember they, they came to LA in like this late, late, late seventies and they got all their friends in the Scientology. But back in the day, like I was explaining before in the seventies and in the eighties and even into the nineties, Scientology felt like a fun thing. The course rooms, I remember when I was a kid, the course rooms at Asho and AO were so full they had to put chairs and tables out in the hallways because there were so many people on course. Couple reasons why. Number one, because they were cheap as fuck back in the day. They didn't cost thousands of dollars. Number two, there were a lot of people, especially from the 70s, were looking for some sort of like a new spiritual path, I guess. And I guess they got a lot of Israelis back in the day to, to like start that whole thing. And then they had kids and then the kids got into it and then the kids got, so it just kind of grew and grew and grew and grew. I have no idea what it's like now, but yeah. So. I hope that most people watching, uh, watching Scientology today um, are able to understand that in the early days, people didn't treat it like a religion. No. It was like a new age self-help mm -hmm. thing. And that's one of the reasons why people who, let's say, were truly raised Jewish in Israel, like truly Jewish, yeah. it wasn't like they had to get over some huge religion hurdle in order to start getting involved in Scientology. You pick up a book and you start reading it and you're like, yeah, this uh, seems kind of, let me try some of this auditing stuff. Auditing is feels more like therapy. It's not worship. So if you're a religious person, auditing doesn't feel religious at all. No, not not at all. <laughs> I so, remember when I was doing my eligibility to get the OT levels when I was first starting, um, they ask you like a ton of questions to make sure that you are eligible to go up your OT levels. And they ask you, do you do other practices? Meaning, do you practice another religion? Do you practice another faith? Even yoga was like part of that thing. Like you couldn't do yoga back in the day because it was technically med meditation or something like that. I said, yeah, I'm Jewish, but I practice it only to, you know, appease my family so then they like just checked with me periodically throughout the next couple of years like okay we just want to make sure that like there's no antagonism coming from your grandparents with you doing scientology oh no they don't care about me doing scientology as long as i just you know continue to do the judaism thing so they don't mind it as long as it doesn't interfere with your scientology process and your auditing right right yeah. all right man well this has been great thank you so much and i hope everybody um found this uh, fun and educational. Uh, it's certainly been fun chatting with you. Awesome. Thank you, Aaron. All right, everybody. See you later. Bye. See ya.